All right, all right, all right. Welcome to the next episode of the podcast. You're joined, as always, by your boy, Heavy Days, here from the Upside Down Library, bringing you all that inside information. But guess what? We couldn't do it without our amazing sponsors. Huge shout out to CT now, number one seed bank in the game. All the best breeders, all the best genetics and the latest drops. If you're not satisfied at the end of your harvest, hit them up. They'll sort you out. Best in the industry. CT now, thank you so much. But in order to be able to properly evaluate the crop, you've got to make sure you have a good harvest free of pests and contamination. And for that, you need to check out the good people at Coppet Biological Systems. These guys have all the latest and greatest predators and technology to ensure that your garden is happy, thriving, pathogen and pest free. If you got spider mites, check out the Spidex Vital with proof of predation technology built in. They turn orange in front of your eyes to show you that they're killing bugs. What more could you want? Well, you got aphids, check out the Acupar M, another killer product, both of these specifically designed for cannabis crops. Gonna help you to have the most successful harvest to date. There's nothing better than knowing that garden is free of pathogens, guys. Get on it, you won't regret it. Likewise, huge shout out to our friends at ProMix. You've known them and loved them for years. They make the most killer mediums in the game, already inoculated with microbes, trichoderma and mycorrhizae. But guess what? Now you can get their standalone ProMix Connect, a mycorrhizal product designed to improve the yields, increase the resin, increase the weight, terpenes, flavonoids, all of it's going to the moon. Don't do your garden a disservice by not using a high quality mycorrhizal product. Truly the best in the game, guaranteed score viability, it's going to improve your crop, no second thoughts about it. ProMix Connect, thank you so much, get on board guys, it's going to make a huge difference. Finally, shout out to our friends at Charlie's Cannabis. You know them and you love them, Oklahoma based, veteran owned, producing some of the most fire, top shelf commercially available cannabis you've ever seen. They recently started making their own missiles. You will not believe the quality of these products. Fino hunted from scratch using new, exciting genetics, all in house. Any products you get from them uses the material they've grown. None of this passing through a million hand stuff made from trim from God knows who's grow. Everything in house, high quality, Charlie's cannabis. Just remember guys, Charlie's your bud. Finally, a huge shout out to the Patreon gang. You are the lifeblood of the show. You guys help to ensure the episodes continue to be made. If you want early access to content, you want to hear unheard interviews, get access to exclusive giveaways, prizes, Discord, so much more, go check out the Patreon, www.patreon.com forward slash the podcast. On this episode, we're joined by the head honcho behind AG Seed Co., a man who's been in the industry a very long time and has a lot of wisdom to share. We're incredibly grateful to have Todd McCormick on the show, here to talk all things history, Northern Lights, Skunk, Haze, Old School Genetics, and so much more. Hope you enjoy. Let's get into it. Alrighty, gang, we're back for another one. And today we are both excited and grateful to have one of the true cannabis historians of the scene on the show. A big welcome to the editor of The Emperor Wears No Clothes, as well as the man behind AG Seed Code, Todd McCormick. Thank you so much for joining us today. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me on. My friend, first question we love to ask our guests What are you smoking on at the moment? <laughs> that's funny this is actually a haze combination i have a lot of uh the original older genetics and i really love original haze and i've kind of crossed it with everything i have and this is one of those concoctions it's an on haze which is a uh, an old neville's haze that i used uh i crossed it against an or- original haze male and i made something called on haze and then i took that and i've crossed this with something called a uh, super glue which was like an afghan northern lights uh, it's really nice. It, I, in some ways, I was trying to recreate that old NL5 haze that we all used to love so much. Oh, lovely. And like, how do you feel this one compares to the old NL5 haze? Um, <clears throat> it's different, you know, because every phenotype we, we pick are different. Even if the plants are brothers and sister seeds, um, there you, you can still get a lot of variation between them too. You know, you can have 
<clears throat> one brother or one sister who's kind of overweight, another one that's really skinny, another that's super smart, another one that can't do math. So it's like that with plants. And it's similar. The original haze is really the smell and the taste that defines haze. And everything else is like fruity or gassy, uh, that leathery kind of Afghan uh, sticky, skunky smell, we call it in North America, <clears throat> is very different from the terpenes that you find in the, that Colombian original haze mixture. It's truly unique. And, and I love it. So I, I really like it however it comes out because I just favor the scent and the flavor so much. Yeah, lovely, lovely. And do you find incorporating some of those more modern genetics brings a little something extra to the table or it maybe just takes it a little different place, so to speak? Uh, well, it's kind of the other way around because original haze is really the first hybrid. It was the first bred in the Santa Cruz Mountains over here near where I live uh, back in 1969. Uh, came along around five, six years before Skunk One, which is what I would call the second uh, real hybrid that that was bred and then became kind of famous. Um, and later on, <clears throat> when I first got exposed to haze, it was in the early 90s. I had visited the Cannabis Castle in 1994 with Jack Herrer. I was standing next to Jack when Ben Dronkers um, gave the Jack Herrer variety its name and, and christened it. Um, and I was able to smoke some of the Northern Lights and the Haze Crosses that were at the castle at that time. I also lived in Amsterdam for over a year after that and visited numerous times after this. But it, it really was different for me because I had been growing for 10 years at that time, but I'd never experienced Haze. So it was just, it was a wow. And I had never experienced cannabis that gave me like a coffee, a morning coffee effect where I felt like invigorated and talkative and engaged I usually a lot of the varieties of cannabis are more like you know you relax you nod out you you know you're in your own little world um but not so much with haze and I was really intrigued and it, it took me years I I picked up seeds I grew Northern Lights number five by haze I grew the Jack Harris seeds that um they gave Jack at the time I wish I still had them and when I lived in Holland, I was able to get a really nice Northern Lights number no. five clone. It was technically the plant that won the 1996 Cannabis Cup as a dirt grown pot, but it, it, as a hydroponically grown pot, but it was really dirt grown. It was truly exceptional. And I loved it. And then years and years go by, uh, 2012, I was in Amsterdam receiving the Cannabis Culture Award along with um, Dr. Lester Grinspoon and Sir, Le Sir Richard Branson of all people. And Skunk Man Sam came to the event and I used the opportunity to ask him and I'd known him since 94. I, I actually was very silly and was like, hey, will you sell me the original hay seeds that you sold Neville? And after he got finished laughing at me, um, he told me that he'd consider it. And then he asked me what else I wanted. And I felt like a dummy. And I thought I was like, I, you know, I don't know what to say. And he says, I think you want all the seeds I save for myself and I don't sell to anybody. And I was like, oh, that's exactly the seeds I was looking for. And uh, he said, bring over your best hash and come over and uh, we'll talk about it. So I went over there and it was really a wonderful experience. You know, Skunk Man Sam is credited with saving original haze. Um, he, he, his home was next to the gentleman uh, who I only know as the, the letter G, who was the surfer who first bred haze. And um, they were neighbors. And the guy down the street was uh, his uh, two initials were RL. He went on to make the 1976 original Hayes poster that became really famous. And um, and also uh, the other neighbor they had down the street was the guy that wrote the psychedelic encyclopedia. So it was quite quite the block over there back in the day. So like, uh, but he, uh, Skunk Man Sam, realized that the original Hayes was a unique cultivar. And he, he saved it by not... Um, losing it most breeders cross what they have with what they've got and they make new varieties and they think they're improving it but they get further and further and further from that original creation and it's not always for the better unfortunately um so what sam did which was unique is he kept it through ivl breeding which is only allowing the males and females from that particular variety to breed with each other so that he could capture those genetics and work with them as, as the generations passed. Um, he took selected plants and he created varieties like Skunk by Haze, uh, by Thai, 
uh, he calls that one. Uh, um, then he has a he has a, a whole shitload of them. In all reality, I feel like a fool listing them all off. But what he did is he gave me the original Hayes seeds, and then he gave me all of his favorite outcrosses with it. Like, uh, which was really quite beautiful because think of it like colors. It's like getting a primary color and then all his favorite secondary colors and you can go home and do art. Uh, so I was really happy. And um, when I realized this, I realized that I had brother and sister seeds of the plants that Neville had. And Neville had two male haze plants that he used to breed with everything. It's quite famous. He had haze hay and haze sea. Um, those two plants came originally through Skunk Man Sam. And um, the seeds that he gave me were essentially brothers and sisters to those males. So when I got home, I took a cutting I had of uh, Neville's haze and then back crossed it, if you will, to a male original haze plant because I wanted uh, to turn up the haze. I wanted more haze, you know? Uh, so I liked it. And um, what made Neville's haze unique to original haze is that touch of Northern Lights, which was a little bit of Afghan that it had. Um, because the recipe for, for Neville's haze was Northern Lights number five by Hayes, uh, Hayes C, I think, crossed back to Hayes A, which was his other, or not crossed back to, but crossed out to his other Hayes A. And that was what he called Neville's haze. And then he took that plant later on and crossed it with Skunk One and called that Super Silver Haze. Um, but that little bit of Northern Lights uh, really is something that I always just loved. And um, at the time, I didn't have original Northern Lights. I just had, you know, things like OG Kush and Super Glue, which are very reminiscent um, in, in all reality. So I, you know, what I was doing is trying to kind of recreate what I had with, with some of these genetics, because going back to Skunk Man Sam is like going back to, to the original source. He's the guy that initially sold the seeds to Neville in the first place. And, um, you know, he's he's really the genius behind Skunk One and quite a few other varieties, even hemp varieties such as Fanola. Just really quite incredible. Yeah, I mean, the the breadth of his work is, is phenomenal. And, I mean, on a personal curiosity, how did your uh, Hayes Backcross end up turning out for you? I love Aunt Hayes. I've used it quite a bit. Um, in 2019, I used the mail from the, that variety that I created, um, and I crossed it against most of these um, like clone-only cultivars floating around California. Because when I was working with it, um, I was realizing that you know when you do a breed, uh, when you're breeding with cannabis, a lot of times the female is a more dominant uh, on in the prodigy than the male. So I was able to kind of use my on haze as almost like a neon filter, where you where there's there's no real color neon, but uh, you because when you take red, blue, green, and you want to make it neon, it's still red, blue, green. And what I wanted to do with a lot of these clone only cultivars, such as Green Crack and OG Kush and uh, Trainwreck and others, is I wanted to retain that red, blue, green, but I wanted to add a little bit of spiciness to it, which was on haze. And um, happy 420 from um, California. And uh, I always stop at 420 and, and light a joint and take a little breath and it's like a little moment of uh, meditation. But um, but that's what I did and it, and it worked out really well. And then you know, as twist of fate would have it, I, you know, after Neville passed away, I wrote an article called Legacy of a Legend. And because um, he most certainly was a legend. And um, I got this comment from a guy named Greg, and he alluded to like Northern Lights living on through Neville's work. And I, I knew Greg's name. I knew that the guy that supposedly brought Northern Lights to Neville was named Greg and that he was from Seattle. And we've heard the story. And uh, I couldn't imagine he was commenting on my my post. So I messaged him and said hi and uh, tried to introduce myself. And he just said, you know, Todd, I've been following you for, since the 90s, you know, like, <laughs> like I know exactly who you are. This is why I'm following your Facebook page. And we started talking and and it was really nice. And uh, he told me that uh, he always wanted to get original Skunk One and he always wanted original Haze, but he couldn't get them through Neville. And that unfortunately him and Neville had a falling out, I'd say about a year and a half after they started doing business, you could say. Uh, Neville kind of went behind his back, tried to buy some of the seeds from another party. And, and that was that was that. And it's interesting because I am a collector of books about cannabis and I have all the old Neville catalogs and there's actually a paragraph in one of the 
pre-catalog letters that he wrote saying, bad news, my Northern Lights supplier is cut off. And and I was just, it just stunned me a little to, to get it from Greg, you know, and what had happened and why that happened, why he got cut off. And I was just like, wow. And um, at the time, I, I sent Greg over the original Haze and Skunk just to be courteous. You know, he's a legend. He deserves it. Let him enjoy these genetics uh, for sure. Um, and then about a maybe a year plus later, t- almost two, uh, we had been staying in contact. And um, he called me and said, hey, my, uh, my sister passed away. And I, I said, wow, I'm really sorry. And he said, well, thank you, but not why I'm calling. Um, I wanted your address, wanted to return the favor. My family found some of my old Northern Light seeds in one of her freezers. And they're from the early 80s, from even before I met Neville. And uh, I'm getting germination out of them and I'd like to see what you get. So I was like blown away and uh, sent him my address. And he sent me Northern Lights number two. He sent me Northern Lights number five. He sent me what is called purest indica which is the Afghan that he got from this gentleman named um, Murphy Stevens. And he, Murphy Stevens, wrote a book called How to Grow Marijuana Indoors Under Lights, one of the best cannabis cultivation books. And I, I literally have every cannabis cultivation book from the 70s. Really quite incredible. He explains um, like cloning. He explains CO2. He explains... <clears throat> Some of the things that have become mainstay, like taking mothers and, and doing selections in, in our work of today, but was kind of unheard of back then. And uh, they were friends because of this indoor, indoor sun shop, it was called. Uh, and they, he'd go in there and buy equipment. And I guess uh, Steve Murphy, uh, Murphy Stevens was his pen name, but his real name was the other way around. Steve Murphy gave Greg some of these Afghan seeds, gave him four of them in the 70s. And that is what became uh, the Northern Lights lines. And then, uh, so what he did is he, you know, Greg F2'd them, you know, which would be to mix the brothers and sister seeds together and made a whole bunch of them. And he called that purest indica because that was the one he got from Murphy Stevens. And then what he started to do is outcross it to other Afghans that he got from Oregon and California and then more tropical plants. And I asked him what the numbers represented when he sent them to Neville. And he said the numbers were one through like 11 or 12 uh, were based on how uh, close they were to that purest indica, you know, one uh, being like, purest indica would more be like zero because if you're counting, it would be like, oh, comes first, purest indica, first hybrid is number one, second hybrid is number two, third, fourth, and so on. Like number five, he told me was actually it crossed with what at the time they thought was a Hawaiian, but he has always believed was a Northern Mexican variety. And uh, it was a little more tropical. So each of the plant numbers became more tropical and truly fascinating. I mean, from my perspective uh, as a historian and just an overall cannabis geek, you know, I started growing in 1984 and I was reading high times back then, like we all were. And, uh, and it, I don't know, it just, like a little boy's dream to now be in communication with this guy and you know he's in his 70s a retired marine he's you know just incredible and so i started growing them out and i have these old books and i have these old photos and later on i'll send you some pictures it's truly remarkable because it looks exactly like the first page in murphy in murphy stevens book uh it just blows blew my mind and um so it's been really wild to now have these original northern lights and now I'm starting to play with those and the original Haze and the original Skunk. And it's quite the palette. Uh, if you were thinking of it like like art, it's it's quite the color palette to start with. And I actually have more of these original colors than even was given to Neville at the time because Neville never received all of Skunk Man Sam's favorite outcrosses with Haze. Um, he never received a batch of original Haze seeds. He only got a couple males. So he was unable to do what I did, which was reproduce as an F2 or an IBL, original haze, um, and basically unlock it and share the genetics. He had to actually use them as hybrids, which uh, started appearing in the the Holland Seed Bank catalog in 1988. Um, Prior to 88, 85, 6, 7, there's not even the word haze mentioned in any of those catalogs. Um, and there's not even the haze, the word haze isn't even mentioned in the super long high times article that was uh, published in Mar- March of 87. Um, 
because I came to the conclusion that Neville just didn't have Hayes at the time. And Greg um, told me that too. And then I've heard it from other people as well. But I, I think it's a real opportunity. I mean, there's been a lot of, you know, breeding uh, done in the past 30 years plus since the 80s. And unfortunately, I don't think a lot of it uh, was for the best. I think that a lot of people were breeding for uh, for for yield and 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 for quickness rather than overall quality and terpenes. And unfortunately, I think we um, somewhat lost our way with some of these older varieties. And now that I have the like, original Skunk One and original Haze and original Northern Lights uh, in various forms, I am it's like a time machine to me because I was growing back in the eighties and now to have, be able to grow these again, is just truly quite remarkable. Sorry. That was so long winded. <laughs> no, that was incredible. And I, uh, I already have that feeling in the back of my neck where I'm like, this is going to be a good one. I can tell <laughs> really. Yeah. A, a myriad of different avenues we could choose to go in after you gave me so many good little leads I could pull on. I guess something I wanted to discuss is, this topic of Neville being a bit disliked, it's an interesting one because I've spoken to a lot of people who know him and the most consistent thing I hear is he was a bit disliked, that he was a, a complex man and although undeniably he did some of the best breeding we've ever seen, he also burnt a lot of bridges. And I guess my question is, do you feel like in a case like Neville, he's sort of one of those people where you've got to separate the art from the artist and did you ever have any personal interactions with him? That's a beautiful way to put it. Um, I did have interactions with Neville. He was always nice to me when I met him. Um, I played chess with him once. Uh, we smoked haze. Um, I enjoyed it. I, I, you know, I grew up around drugs as a kid. I was a, a little biker kid. And um, my cousin Kathy died from a heroin overdose way back in the early 90s before I ever met Neville. And I grew up around people that unfortunately uh, did abuse alcohol and were flirting with heroin. And, um, you know, when, when you grow up around it as a little kid, you kind of feel it. And, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm, I, I don't do hard drugs. I don't drink. I smoke hash. I smoke grass, uh, kind of square in a way. Um, but you know, other than cannabis, we didn't have what we get high on in common. And unfortunately, you know, Neville, you know, what I what I respect about Neville, and I'd like to say up front is when you read that article back in 1987, he's not a victim. He's never been a victim of his own circumstance. He doesn't portray himself as a victim. He deals with his addiction issues like an adult. And, you know, he's remorseful for him. He's realistic about trying to struggle to deal with it. I have nothing but empathy for someone who's dealing with alcohol uh, and, and, and drug addiction. It's like a it's like a disease. I get people say, well, it's a it's a consensual disease. You, 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 you smoke the stuff, you, you drink the stuff, this is your fault, but chemically it, it gets a little deeper than that. And unfortunately, I believe that that, you know, his, his substance abuse absolutely compromised his personal relationships with a lot of good people. And unfortunately, when I was writing legacy of the legend, I know a lot of people that knew Neville that was in business with Neville that like really close to Neville, none of them wanted to say a damn thing. And, uh, and unfortunate, you know, because, you know, it's, is it so much he burnt the bridges or it was his addictions that caused him to burn the bridges? I mean, it, you, you, you know, but he did burn bridges. I, I've interviewed Skunkman Sam, I've interviewed Greg, uh, and, and they told similar stories around the same time about how Neville ripped them off, knocked off their seeds, went behind their back, it killed their relationships with them. And, um, you know, Greg and Sam don't know each other. So, so they, they're not, there's, they, they, they didn't meet until recently when I gave each other their numbers and said, Hey, you guys, you know, you're both in your seventies, you're both legends. You should talk to each other. Uh, but up until now, they never had communication. So it's interesting for me, a journalist to hear these unedited, you know, versions of, of events from the people who, who, who were really in, in touch and, and have the genetics now and, and had the genetics then. And, um, you know, and then, you know, and as far as Neville, I, and I don't mean to, to bash, a, a, you know, as, a, as someone who grew up in the 80s, I, he was a hero to me in all reality, like, like a rock star, Led Zeppelin, there was, there was the Holland Seed Bank. And unfortunately, though, the more you get into the history of it, you know, like, 
Neville only picked up a Mel Frank Row book in 1981. Uh, he was inspired by it, uh, and he started the the Holland Seed Bank '84. Uh, initially, he started selling seeds he was collecting from Dutch coffee shops that he hadn't grown, and he literally had a disclaimer saying, "I can't vouch for these. I didn't make them. I think he was selling for like 25 cents each." Um, and his world changed when he met Skunk Man Sam and got that whole catalog of really worked California genetics, um, California Orange, Skunk One, Hindu Kush, Afghani One, Durban Poison. None of those Neville, Neville had anything to do with. And, um, and realistically, at the time with the drug war and everything, you know, a lot of people weren't really stepping up to say, oh, yeah, that's me that I did that. And uh, he, he begot these genetics, 1984, 1985. And kind of took credit for the work of many people that came before him. And I don't believe now in today's cannabis economy or, or, or community that if somebody was growing wheat for two or three or four years, even let's give him 81, which I understand he wasn't growing in 81, 82 or 83. He did grow in 84 outside of his apartment before he got the cannabis castle. Uh, and it didn't work out. It was outdoors. It, you know, that the winter came, it was just a, in the backyard type of thing. And it wasn't until he moved into the castle that they started growing indoors and he started getting help from people that went to the university. Um, so really, he had no experience breeding. He was a heroin addict who was trying to get off heroin, got a loan from the government, started selling seeds, bought seeds that were really good and started mixing them together. And I don't want to say, I mean, it, it's like these DJs that take really good music from one artist and really good music from another artist and mash it together. And it sounds great on the dance floor, but they're not musicians, man. They can't, they, they can't write love me do they, they're not making these beats that they, they're just taking somebody else's work and jingling it together. And, and they're little rock stars on their own merit, but on their own, they're really not musicians. And, and I, and I hate to say this, but I don't see Neville as much of a breeder um, because he was handed such fantastic varieties and he crossed them together, mainly because he wasn't paying the people for their seeds anymore. So unfortunately, we saw things like skunk number two and and him selling a half price seeds from and then literally in the catalog, it says, you know, there was like a, a, an a unexpected pollination. and I'm selling these at half price. And, you know, if, if Mr. Jack Daniels went to a distillery and sold them his number seven whiskey recipe, and then, you know, a year or so, the, the distillery realized, you know what, don't need Jack anymore. We can knock off this whiskey recipe and send it out the door, tell him to beat feet. I don't think it would be a good energy. And that's exactly what Neville did to Greg. It's exactly what he did to Skunk Man Sam. So unfortunately, yeah, things went the way they did. And and then when you get into the, the handover of the Holland Seed Bank to Sensi Seeds, it was continued in all reality. I mean, you know, initially when Ben bought the Holland Seed Bank, he attempted to trademark all of the super skunk, skunk, one, haze names, uh, and sent cease and desist letters to other seed companies telling them, you can't use my names. And uh, Skunk Man Sam got a letter and, uh, Unfortunately for Ben, he had already registered these varieties with the plant registry and technically was the legal breeder of them in the EU and sent Ben a letter saying, no, you don't have the right. You can use the name Skunk One on a lighter or on a T-shirt, but as it comes to cannabis, I own that. And if you try to stop other people from using a name that I came up with in the 70s, I will go into court and block you. So Ben lost the ability to... Uh, basically trademark and register these these names that are now pub very much public domain, you know, as as were the genetics in all reality, because Skunk Man Sam had been selling seeds by the kilo long before he met Neville. Uh, and um, plenty of people had Skunk One seeds and, or, you know, California Orange. And, you know, originally it was Mel Frank who made Durban Poison and Afghan Number One. So, it was really a lot of other people, you know, that that really were the reason why the the Holland Seed Bank had such great varieties in the first place. You know, uh, in a really in one of his last interviews, if not his last interview, Neville is in Mishka's book, and uh, he talks about how he was never able to make anything worth anything from land race varieties of cannabis, and he gives credit to the breeders who came before him who took things like Afghan, 
you know, Colombian gold and Acapulco gold and turned it into skunk one and, you know, Colombian genetics and turned it into haze and in the first place. And I honestly don't know how spectacular the Holland Seed Bank would have been if he hadn't gotten those American genetics from Sam and Greg and others through the 80s reality if he was just left to the jamaican colombians and thai seeds coming in through the coffee shops it might have been a very different story yeah very very intriguing and very interesting to hear sort of a more inside take on it all because i think that was i wouldn't say a pet peeve but something which i always felt uneasy about was how yeah people always said oh you know neville's had a shady past but no one would ever say to me what so it's good to hear like you know this is some of what it boiled down to and i guess the natural question which comes to mind for me is in my mind i always thought a lot of those raw base genetics neville used to make the crosses came from like one of those mythical land race trips he did but are you sort of more of the opinion that it it was more given to him for the most part well northern lights was sent to him as seeds one through 11 uh, i believe one through 12 and um and he made some of them very famous. The number five he used, the number six he used, the number two he used extensively. Um, Greg did send tell me that he never sent Neville the purest indica, the the zero, if you will, the original egg of Northern Lights, because he didn't want Neville to have something better than what he had. He he sent Neville to hybrids. Um, so, you know, I I think that growers in some ways have been wise to the fact that they're going to get burned at to a degree and uh, they've wanted to protect their ip in various ways and simon schmidt who's dutch and owns uh serious seeds he's a good friend of mine absolute hero of mine really um but when he first started serious seeds he only started with three varieties um ak-47 chronic and cali mist and they were all F1s. And he held the parent plants to each of those three varieties. And he could make those seeds forever and ever and ever. And if somebody bought those seeds and then crossed them together or outcrossed them, now you, you got something different. And, um, and because of that, you would always go back for that F1 Cali mist from Serious Seeds because it was exactly what it was last time you bought the seeds. And that was a way that he protected his intellectual property, if you will. Um, nobody could really make uh, an F1 of Cali Mist, but Simon. Um, so, you know, as this is, when you look at it that way, uh, that was happening even with Greg. That's why Greg didn't send him the original Purist Indica. That's why Skunk Man Sam didn't give, that's why That's why Neville never got original hay seeds is because he didn't want them to be able to F2 them and and make seeds of them. He He wanted to kind of keep control of the variety a little bit because, you know, I get it. Uh, and, you know, in all reality, Neville had to wait for the haze. He didn't get it. It, it or even offered to him in 85 or 84 when he first bought the seeds from, from Sam. But also, there wasn't much desire for them because here there are these long flowering, you know, not even great yielding comparatively. You know, the, the Dutch and indoor growers were looking for quick flowering short plants that yielded that heavy resin that made indoor growing practical and Hayes sure the hell didn't make indoor growing practical it was quite the opposite so not there wasn't really a demand for them even when i was living there in 1996 people i mean cali mist sure nl5 Hayes, sure but were people growing original haze? No. And very few people were actually breeding with it because not that many people actually had, you know, an interest in dealing with these long flowering finicky plants. And uh, in 1996, I was uh, living in Amsterdam and I was working at Positronics, which is owned by Bernard and the gentleman named Old Ed, who originally taught uh, Bernard how to grow seedless cannabis in the 70s, was over there. And um, he and I worked together for a year growing out various varieties of Posse's genetics. And unfortunately, uh, you know, after 10 years of, you know, politely, I'll say haphazard breeding or breeding that wasn't for, let's say, overall potency or, or, or flavor or scent, but instead quickness and yield, uh, a lot of them didn't have that. They weren't that they were kind of watered down or muddied up would be a polite way to say it. And uh, what me and Ed were trying to do was make selections and then try to make some F1s that could kind of bring back some hybrid vigor and uniformity uh, and consistency to the seeds that Posi was selling. And 
you know, I, I, part of what I wanted to do when I started my seed company was jump a, a way back and get seeds directly from Skunk Man Sam and skip Neville, skip Bernard, skip the whole Dutch scene, you know, um, because nothing against, I mean, I got nothing but love and respect for a lot of my, my, my friends in Holland, but, but realistically, the, the, the purpose of what they were making seeds for was not necessarily the purpose of what the California people who were breeding, which was quality over quantity and everything else. And then they got out there and it was about, you know, quantity, quickness and quality kind of went down. And I think a lot of people that were visiting the Netherlands coffee shop scene through the 90s would attest that the, the cannabis wasn't getting better over the years. It was kind of getting more and more uh, homogenous and, uh, and, and lackluster and just uh, very similar to each other. And a lot of that was because of a lot of inbreeding. And, uh, you know, I, hopefully what I'm doing now is kind of taking it back to the heart of it and going for the quality and going for those terpenes and going for that scent and the taste over the potency even because like, I, I feel that if, if you have a good joint, like this one is getting me totally stoned and I'm hard, not a hard time getting through it. But uh, if you have a good joint, even if it's not that potent, you'll go back and roll a second. Or if it's good hash, you'll go back and, and pack another dab. Um, but if it's not that good, uh, it doesn't matter how potent it is. You know, it's like when you drink, you know, you don't drink straight alcohol to get drunk. You kind of like the nuances of the wine or the beer or whatever it is you're drinking. So I think that's the same with cannabis. And I think, as, as we get back into that quality over quantity and quickness, we're going to see a lot better cannabis hitting the scene. And unfortunately, because of like that quick, you know, mindset, all the varieties that were 10 weeks and, you know, 10 to 16 weeks really don't get grown by people anymore. Um, but they're still around and think of it like a box of crayons that have 16 crayons. We're only playing with the first 10 crayons. There's crayons number 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16 there, and people aren't even doing art with them yet. And, and that's, in a sense, why I'm really excited to be bringing the original Hayes genetics back and, and kind of moving towards these equatorial varieties that used to be shunned because of bag appeal and growth characteristics, but were really great. I mean, once you started smoking it, you'd love it, you know, but would you get past the bag appeal to, to get your joint rolled up. And a lot of people don't, they, they, they eat with their eyes rather than with their taste buds. And I think that that's going to change as we move towards concentrates and extracts and people are doing dabs and you're feeling the terpenes and feeling the, the synergy of cannabinoids, if you will. And I, I, I think people will start buying cannabis based on how it makes them feel over how it looks in a bag. Yeah, I, I certainly hope so myself and, you know, so many avenues we could go off onto with that one. I guess the first thing I wanted to quickly run by you was you mentioned this idea of growers protecting their intellectual property and I think that's still a relevant discussion in today's market. Specifically, we hear some breeders, not many, but some who are quite vocal about even if you buy their seeds, you still need to ask them if you're going to breed with it or something to that effect. Whereas a good number of breeders take the opposite point of view and they're like, man, if you bought them, they're yours. Where do you stand on that issue? I'm strange. I stand on both sides of the fence. I completely, I call it public domain genetics. Um, nobody invented cannabis. I wouldn't have this wonderful joint of haze if it wasn't for, you know, some guy named G that was playing with it a year before I was born. So I'm grateful for the, you know, shoulders of the giants I stand upon. And I try to give credit where credit's due it at every corner of this. Um, but that said, um, you know, when somebody like Simon used to use serious seeds as an example, uh, wants to put a company together and put out a product like Cali Minister AK or Chronic, um, I think they should have a right to be able to try to make something unique. And, it, and by doing it the way Simon did it, which was so intelligent, it gives his customers a reason to go back and get those F1 seeds from him because they know why they, they have a reason to, um, because they know it's authentic and he's the only one that held the parents. Um, now, the way it works in plant breeding, uh, if you buy seeds and you outcross with them, the prodigy is your creation. OK, but, uh, you know, to take somebody's seeds and, and just mix them together and and, uh, and to like, you know, do what so many did. It, 
which is to F2 them without permission is not so cool. I, I had original haze from 2012 till 2019 and I was growing it and playing with it. And it wasn't until I started my seed company that I called up Skunk Man Sam and, and formally asked his permission to make seeds of it. And, uh, you know, within his good graces, I did. He even consulted on how he recommended I reproduce those original seeds that he gave me so that I would get the best, you know, quality out of the prodigy and have the most uh, variability in selection. And I appreciated that. And, and he, he did too. And when I got the original Northern Light seeds from Greg, I again asked his permission and um, and not only did he give me his permission, he, he gave me his encouragement because his goal has been to share the genetics with people and, you know, to spread the medicine. And uh, and it's beautiful. I mean, a lot of people don't know Skunk Man Sam's goal in the 1970s was to create a true beating or a relatively true breeding variety because he was an acid eating hippie and he wanted his friends to be able to get the seeds and to be able to mix them together, the brothers and sisters together, and to have the prodigy come out relatively close to the parents. And normally that doesn't happen. Like when you mix closely related genetics together, you get like a dog's breakfast, you get, you know, a, a lot of variation. The haze has got a lot of variation in its genetics. It's not relatively true breeding at all. It's the opposite of skunk one. And when I asked Skunk Man Sam, you know, why, how did you do that? He said, I didn't, nature did. He said, I just had to cross together enough plants to find the ones that when I crossed them together, they had the uh, effect of being able to be a relatively true breeding plant. And I was just like, wow. And it kind of went to show how humble he was. There's a great article that we republished in our magazine, Grow, uh, called Sun Soil Seeds and Soul. And he wrote it for what was called Blotter, magazine, which was an LSD magazine that was published by the gentleman who would go on to publish the psychedelic encyclopedia. And he wrote this really long breakdown of how people can learn how to breed and how he created things like Skunk One. Um, and he was trying to share the information. I mean, anybody who's done a lot of acid would understand that kind of like feeling the oneness with uh, all of humanity. And that was his goal. His goal was to turn Skunk One into this massive public domain genetic that would only create good cannabis for the rest of the world once they got the seeds. And that's why Skunk One has been bred and into everything because it adds this consistency and uniform to practically everything that you cross it with. Uh, it's unique in the cannabis kingdom. And um, yeah, that's in a way why it became so famous. Yeah, truly one of the most famous strains of all time and interesting to hear the backstory. Yeah, that's that's cool the way Sam's quite humble about it. I was interested to quickly loop back for a moment and ask you, you know, you, you spoke about the Holland Seed Bank and Positronics and Sirius Seeds and one of the seed banks besides the seed bank itself, the Holland Seed Bank, um, like yourself, you know, a lot of reverence for them. I also really, really looked up to Super Sativa Seed Club. Where did you rank them? Um, you know, uh, I believe that Carl got the inspiration to create SSSC, uh, out of what Neville was doing with seed bank. Um, and, uh, Carl also went and purchased seeds from, uh, skunk man, Sam as well. Everybody did really when Sam moved there and started working with Renard on the green team, they were providing seeds to all of these, you know, the flying Dutchman and others that started up even before, Sensi Seeds was Sensi Seeds. It was the Sensi Seed Club. It was technically SSC and not SSSC, which was the Super Sativa Seed Club. And um, they were all doing this uh, to a degree. And uh, SSCC was cool. I mean, they got, you know, some of the Hayes genetics and some of the skunk and, and some of the stuff that Sam had at the time. And they made some cool things with it. But I would say they probably lost most of it, like many of my friends did over there, by not being mindful like Sam was and keeping it isolated from all the other work he was out crossing and making sure that he created an IBL line that was vast enough that he could go back to the original genetics and they didn't have Afghan and they didn't have Hindu Kush and they didn't have Thai, didn't have anything else. It was just that three-way Colombian. And unfortunately, a lot of them lost it. And when I started up my seed company, one of the first orders I received was from SSSC. So I, you know, they wanted the original Hayes back and uh, unfortunately, their seeds got sent back to me because I didn't have a photosanitary certificate. And Amsterdam was being a, 
kind of rude that day, I guess, at customs, but I'm sure I'll be able to get them the seeds in the future, you know, but I, I think they played a great role in this too, you know. Um, I think these seed banks were the first heroes because they were the brave ones that made them available to everybody and we all benefited from it um, to a large degree. You know, unfortunately, Neville worked with some, you know, shitty people and he was turned in by the guy that was actually sending his seeds for him um, from Michigan. So the story in a short way goes that um, somebody called Neville up back when Neville was answering the phone and drummed up a friendship over the phone with Neville from Michigan. And Neville invited him out to the castle. And this guy, um, Anthony Ray Kogo, went out there numerous times. And something happened with the seed sender that Neville had in America. Neville would send cans of seeds to the Americas and then um, in bulk. And then somebody in America would get addresses and quantities of which variety to send to these addresses. And they would package it up in America and send 10, 20, 15, whatever seeds out at the time. And unfortunately, um, Anthony Ray Kogo was was jealous, was angry, was something at Neville. And unfortunately, um, he had been sending Neville seeds for about 18 months. And he got busted for bringing, from what I understand, hashish into a jail to one of his friends in Michigan and got arrested for it. Neville un sent money to him to help him uh, on the bequest of his wife. I've read this in the court paperwork. The interesting story is a little bit is that after Neville passed away, uh, right before he passed away, actually about two weeks, I was arguing with somebody on Instagram that was claiming that sunk man Sam turned in Neville. And it wasn't true. It isn't true. It, there's no truth to it, in the, it whatsoever. And uh, the guy that I was arguing with that was making this point um, fancied himself an attorney. So he went to a, a court website and um, downloaded Neville's paperwork. He downloaded the two indictments. He downloaded the uh, statements from the witnesses and the police um, and uh, contacted me and said, hey, you're right. Skunk Man Sam had nothing to do with Neville getting busted. It was this guy named Ray Anthony Kogo that used to send his seeds. And I said, how can you be so certain? And he said, I'll send you the paperwork. I paid $29 and 60 cents and, and I downloaded all the paperwork. Anybody can. And I was a little shocked. So he sent over the, the court paperwork and I got, and I'll send it to you afterwards. Actually, you can, it's quite intriguing. Um, but it was the whole statement of Anthony Ray Kogo. The statement was taken in uh, January of 1994. And um, it starts in, I would say March or April, May of 1989, when Anthony Ray Kogo willfully went into the DEA with all of these addresses that he had saved, even though Neville told him to destroy the addresses after he sent the seeds, this SOB saved the addresses, brought the addresses to the DEA and turned in, Neville turned in all these people at the same time and cut a deal for himself. Incredible. And, um, Tr truly amazing because unfortunately Neville was paying him to send the seeds, but they made a deal that Neville sold him the recipe to his nutrients. And this guy came back and started selling Kogo's nutrients. This is still for sale today and brags about the fact that he got the recipe from the Netherlands. And, and once he had that recipe and his, and he was making the fertilizer, he really didn't need Neville anymore. He didn't need to work for Neville anymore. So he turned him in. And he acted as an undercover witness, if you will, 1989, 90, 91, 92, 93, because they didn't take his sworn statement until January of 94. So poor Neville didn't even know who did it for the, at first. You know, you, you take 1990, 91, 92, 93. It, it, was a, it was a mystery to Neville all the way up until the case was dismissed in, I think, 02. Uh, and only then was this paperwork made public. And then there was no internet like this. So you couldn't go to pacer.net or .gov and download the court file. So, so it, it took a long time, I think, for Neville to truly find out who was really behind turning in the seed bank and what the real story was. But unfortunately, it was this guy, Anthony Ray Kogo. And, um, and that's inevitably what took Neville down. It's so interesting, you know, what, what's the saying? I remember Skunk VA said it, uh, 
real life is always more interesting than fiction or something like that. But it sort of holds true. And the the general question that comes to mind for me after hearing that is we often see a lot of people blaming a lot of stuff on Dave Watson. And I've had Ryan Lee, um, Chimera, who you're probably familiar with. I like Ryan a lot. Ryan stayed at my house before. Yeah. There you go, right? And and Ryan is adamant that, you know, the same as you, Sam's never, never done any of this bullshit. So my question is, why do you think he's the scapegoat for all the bad stuff that happens? You know, and I, I, I don't think he is a scapegoat for any of it. I think Neville, I, you know, I, 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 to put it in plain English, I think Neville's a fucking asshole for starting the room as he started about David Watson. You know, calling somebody a DE agent is akin to calling him a pedophile. It was the most horrible thing you could do. It's the biggest traitor in the world. And, um, and, and, and he knew it wasn't true. He knew he was lying. He knew it. He knew it. And he lied anyway. And he did it to bolster his own reputation. And he, and he was bolstering the work, his own work, based on the work of, of, of Skunkman Sam, David Watson. I mean, there's no two shits about it. I mean, David was the genius. I mean, David still is a genius. I mean, you know, talk about stability. He just celebrated, I think, his 52nd wedding anniversary with the same woman. I mean, you go back to David's history in 1970, him and his girlfriend sold all their personal possessions and, and took a hippie trip from London to Morocco to Germany and hitchhiked all the way across to India at, through Afghanistan, the Hindu Kush Mountains, and, and, and they lived in India for a year. David collected the genetics. He brought him back to Santa Cruz. He started his breeding. Three or four years later, he came up with Skunk One. And all along the way, he was collecting genetics. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be smoking haze. It would have been long lost 40, 45 years ago. Um, you know, he was really a, a savior of the seed and on a level that no one else really has ever reached. I mean, to me, David's one of my heroes. I mean, people don't really know the depth of the genius he was, but uh, more people are starting to realize it. And, you know, for the longest time, I respected his wishes and didn't, uh, I, I separated his hippie identity from his professional identity because his skunk man, Sam was the acid eating hippie, you know, that was trying to make the world better, getting him good seats. And then when he grew up, had a couple daughters, you know, became kind of square and uh, started following the progress of Marinol, which is a synthetic version of, of THC and saw there being an opportunity to create a generic version of THC. He literally country shopped, realized he could start uh, a company in the Netherlands uh, called Horta Farm, and he could become the very first private commercial cannabinoid pharmaceutical company in the world. And he did it. And, you know, part of the anger that my Dutch friends, Ben, Bernard, Neville, a few others have had against him is that they didn't understand how he got a license to grow cannabis in the Netherlands and they didn't know how to. And the truth is they could have all gotten licenses to start a cannabinoid pharmaceutical company if one, they knew what they were frigging doing or if they saw the market, the international market for medical cannabinoids, but they, they weren't on that trip. You know, I'm actually writing an article called Ants Under the Skyscraper, which is actually about the formation of the Dutch seed companies. And I, and I labeled it that because I feel as if these guys were like the ants under a skyscraper that cannot comprehend the engineering or the building that they live under. They can't comprehend the sophistication that's happening on the penthouse floor. They, 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 they just don't get it. And those guys didn't get medical cannabis for a very long time. They didn't know what terpenes were. Um, you know, look at the pollinator, nothing against Mila. I think she's incredible, but she named her resin extraction machine male pollen because I, I lack of better understanding should have been called the resonator because realistically she was tumbling female flowers and extracting the resin heads from it. She wasn't tumbling male flowers and extracting the pollen from it, but that's the kind of misunderstanding I saw when I moved there, you know, and, you know, and I, and I got where, why there was a mystery. And unfortunately, you know, what people don't understand, they often condemn. And I think that a lot of these people condemned it. And when Horta Farm hit the scene and suddenly there was this David Watson, 
a lot of the people that had met Skunkman Sam under his fake name, Sam, um, and his last name was his hippie acid nickname, Jingles, just spelled backwards, which is really kind of funny. So he's a big dude. He's over six foot tall, and he used to wear these gesture hats that had bells on it when he would there'd be these like legendary acid parties in the 60s before it was you know illegal and and in the 70s still and and they were heavy into psychedelics this is where the grateful dead was born these are the santa cruz mountains where ken kesey was and the merry pranksters were this is this is what was going on back then and he used to wear a jester's cap that that jingled and uh so his nickname was jingles and when he moved over there it was also skunk man sam and when he moved over there, it just became Sam Selnedge, which was Jingles Backwards. And um, and I get it. I mean, my friend who publishes Grow Magazine, when you meet him, he usually says his name's Guy. It's not. It's Steve. But he has a wife and a kids. And he's, you know, trying to create a little bit of division between his family and the and the BS. And, uh, and I get it. And it was no different back then. And then when people discovered that Skunkman Sam was David Watson, they turned it into a big conspiracy. And it really wasn't. And you know, unfortunately, just because of their own lack of imagination, they didn't start cannabinoid research, you know, companies, uh, because they didn't know anything about it, man. They didn't see the market potential. They didn't have multi-million dollar investors that wanted to invest into what could become a multi-billion dollar company in the future. I mean, I think these guys were forward looking. And when you look at the work they put out, like hashish, hemp diseases and pests, later cannabis, evolution and ethnobotany, uh, you know, even the Hemp Industries Association that put out a, a peer reviewed journal printed on 100% hemp paper and provided hemp educational kits made out of like hemp wax crayons and plastics and like you name it, hemp seeds, fabric, all of it, paper, and then sent it to universities so that the academics at the universities would get a better understanding of cannabis. Like to, to call these people DE agents is the most ridiculous shit you could ever call them because it's like, if you think the DEA is going to let their fucking rogue agents write these incredible volumes of cannabis history and practical utility, you're crazy, man. I mean, they're they're spending billions of dollars to go against cannabis and you think they're going to plant these two guys in the Netherlands so that they can pursue cannabinoid research and then write about it and then send this damn information to the universities which is only going to work to subvert the propaganda that the DEA is putting out in the first place so i take great offense at the lies and the rumors that were not only started by Neville that were continued and circulated by Ben Dronkers, by Bernard Bruning, and others who knew that they were fucking lying, but were lying to benefit their own reputation. And I still think they should be condemned for doing so because I wouldn't want somebody calling me a DEA agent after I self surrendered and did a five year prison sentence rather than cooperate. I mean, it's the worst thing you can say to somebody that has a clear conscience. You know what I mean? And now I'm glad that Skunk Man Sam has outlived a lot of these people and that the truth has come out and that his reputation is being, you know, for what it really is, you know, not based on some heroin addicts fantasy of what he wished it was, but on the reality of, of, of a lifelong's worth of work, basically protecting the seed, sharing the information, and doing good for for the world around him, and and that's, I I feel really passionate about Skunk Man Sam and David Watson. I, he's one of the nicest people I've ever known. I've known him since 1994. One of the most solid people I've ever known. You know, I mean, a lot of us don't have relationships with our loved ones that last 51 two years, and you know, it really goes to show what kind of a person he is. Everybody that I know that knows him really loves him and has respect and admiration for him. And, you know, I, after knowing him for so long, I understand why he's never done a bad thing. He's never said a bad thing. He's never lied to me. And to me, that matters. Yeah. Very impassionate and uh, informative answer there. And I, I would agree. Everyone who I've spoken to who knows him personally has echoed your sentiment and, I guess I've just got two final little questions on Neville before we sort of talk about some other stuff. And 
I guess I'm interested for the last few years before Neville passed away because he he did pass away a few years ago now. He was actually a little bit active on the Mr. Nice Guy forums and he was causing a bit of waves over there with some of the stuff he posted. I was wondering, did you ever get around to reading that and did you have any thoughts on any of it? Because some of the stuff he posted went very much against the grain of what the stories that were circulating sort of said. Do you think maybe he was just a bit unwell or do you think there was maybe some truth to it all? Unfortunately, I think Neville was one of the, you know, <clears throat> first cannabis uh, people to like reinvent the stories and put out misinformation to benefit himself. And, you know, when he broke up with Arian very publicly, you know, for those that read forums back then, it wasn't a pretty divorce. Uh, he took his genetics and he sold them to Scotty. He didn't move to Switzerland. He didn't follow Scotty. He didn't go do breeding. He said, here you go, give me money. And he helped market the genetics that Scotty was making in Switzerland until the point where Scotty got busted. And unfortunately, Scotty also went to jail for five years. I believe it was quite a while. Um, and, you know, Neville was already out of the picture at that point. And I don't know what of those genetics were saved or lost because I wasn't there. I um, Scotty is Shanty Baba, by the way. I mean, I knew Scotty as the guy that worked for Arian when I first went to uh Amsterdam, Ari and, and Scotty were, you know, Scotty was like his assistant, if you will. He, and, um, and I like Scotty. I, I've always thought Scotty was really cool. I, I didn't know him around the name change. I, I'm, you know, I don't know where the Shanti Baba came from, but whatever. And, uh, you know, and I think Scotty's a good grower, man. He's got a lot of experience and stuff. Uh, but he inherited the genetics that he got from Neville. And, you know, Neville pulled the same thing with uh, Ari and that he pulled with Ben. I mean, when him and Ben broke up, he took his genetics. He had people that he knew that worked it since since he destroyed the genetics. And even worse, I mean, I know firsthand that the person that supposedly was supposed to destroy the plants stole the plants and then years later offered them back for sale to Sensi, uh, which is just such double cross that it's just like, but you saw a lot of it back then. And, uh, you know, but he broke up with Ben. And, you know, talk shit about Ben. And then he broke up with Arian, talk shit about Arian, uh, you know, and I don't know what his relationship with Scotty was towards the end, but he was using the forum as a soapbox. And unfortunately, a lot of the stuff that I've seen, uh, it doesn't go with the stories Greg's told me, the stories Rob Clark's told me, the stories that Skunkman Sam's told me, uh, the story that Ben's told me and Alan Dronkers. I've spent time with all these people um, and, you know, unfortunately they they sing a similar song and they're not in the same room together and unfortunately it doesn't paint a very pretty picture you know it paints a picture of people that were disappointed in somebody that they tried to like a lot you know but somebody that was dealing with the demons of addiction and unfortunately that was spilling into the rest of their life so neville was haunted in a polite way and who knows what kind of a person he would have been if you take the heroin and the alcohol that way you know could have been a whole different world for him he could still be alive today but it's not the not the Neville that he was, and you just got to accept people for what they are, and you know, give sympathy and pity where where it belongs. I mean, anybody who's a drug addict, I feel for them. I unfortunately not one, but I I have nothing but empathy for people that are struggling with addiction. But it doesn't give them a free pass to be able to try to destroy the reputations of good people, um, especially when they know they're lying. You know, especially when they know with what they're saying is is not true. Yeah, in that form, I kind of condemn them. Yeah, no, I understand where you're coming from. And I think maybe the saddest part about what you just said is that I think you banged it on their head in that Neville probably likely would still be around if he didn't have those demons. On the other end of the spectrum, the question has to be asked, would we have had the same offerings from him? And yeah. Well, it was the addiction that caused him to start the seat company. Don't forget, it was a grant from the Dutch government because he was dealing with uh addiction maintenance and they were trying to get him on to starting a business and the Dutch government gave him a loan to start the Holland Seed Bank um, back in 1984 which is quite astonishing you know only only in, only in the Netherlands could could this story be what what the reality the reality is always much stranger than fiction yeah well to loop it back i guess i sort of wanted to end the neville discussion on a more brighter note and something which i've always suspected is that the point you made about how he's like a dj you know he's sort of mixing and mashing other people's work that that kind of resonated with me and what i thought is if we're going to use those terms to keep it simple 
I sort of get the feeling there haven't really been as many DJs on the same level as Neville. Like, as much as I agree with what you're saying, he didn't create the music, so to speak, so it's he shouldn't be credited with that. But I also feel like he did a pretty darn good job as a DJ. Would you agree with that? And do you think there are any other people who are in that same echelon of mixing and matching and creating really standout work? Sure. Uh, you know, Kenny, Kenny Morrow, Trichrome Technologies, that poster behind me over here, I think. Kenny uh, Ultraviolet, which was the what became Purple Passion, Granddaddy Purple, everything else, uh, was his work back in the mid-90s. He released that. He's released quite a few varieties over the course of time. Um, Simon Schmidt, I think, is a phenomenal breeder. I mean, he went to school for plants. He's, he's, his his company has been around now, I think, 30 years, almost uh, 94, I think it started. So he's coming close to around his 30-year anniversary. Um, and, you know, there's Skunk Man Sam, who's really a god over Neville. I mean, Neville used to really kind of attack Sam all the time, but Neville never made a skunk one. Never, Neville never made any of the varieties that Sam gave and sold to him and that he built his business upon. And he always tried to steal the credit from where the credit was due, which is something I don't do. Uh, you know, but then again, when you look at a lot of these California varieties, um, you know, Sour Diesel, train wreck green crack god bud you know i could go on and on who made california orange i don't know but it was really good weed and uh you know unfortunately through the drug war we didn't get a lot of people who had the courage that neville really had to stick his head above the water and say yeah i did that and then and i and i'll give him credit to this day i mean i think we should you know i wanted to emulate him i was when i met him he was still a hero to me you know i his his courage to do something that was you know wrong uh was right you know he is selling the seed to the community was a good thing unfortunately operation green merchant came out of it and he got a lot of people busted uh because of his poor relationships or his poor picking of relationships um but you know you can't go back and fix the people that screw you over. I sometimes wonder if that guy was a cop the whole time and that that was a full engagement because why else would he have saved all those addresses if he didn't plan on using those addresses at a later time to his benefit? So there was clearly a backdoor that he was leveraging um, at the time. He was also growing and doing his own thing. So maybe he just felt like if he did get popped, he would just turn over, which he did. Um, but if you read when you get it, you'll see what I mean. When you read it, he went willingly to the DEA and turned in Neville and turned in all of his customers. So, you know, there's there's two sides of every sword, I guess. And uh, unfortunately, uh, <clears throat> a lot of people got sliced by it, but it created a new opportunity. And look at all the seed companies, SSSC, uh, the Flying Dutchman, Paradise Seed. Luke is awesome. You know, he's a really good one too. Luke has maintained a long time. Sensi Star is a great variety. Um, you know, there's other people like, you know, the guy that made White Widow, his name was Igmar. Um, not much of a breeder, but he made a variety that a lot of people, you know, to this day recognize, you know, uh, so I think there has been a lot of people along the way. I mean, Greg is another one. The guy, uh, Murphy Stevens, that really started all this with his Afghan is also very underrated to a large degree. We're all smoking uh, Prodigy from, from what he started, you know, way back when. I asked Skunk Man Sam before what would have been the most popular cannabis variety had you not released Skunk One. And without a hiccup, he said, oh, Northern Lights. You know, so Northern Lights was that impactive. And it was, it was, you know, those Afghans that Murphy Stevens Indica was was floating around in the 70s and 80s, long before Neville ever started a seed company. So how many of these other varieties also had it? We don't know, you know, and, uh, you know, the truth is, is that unless we really get good genetic testing, DNA testing, and we get better samples in, we're not going to know the relations of these plants. And, uh, you know, I, I once asked Ben Dronkers, I said, hey, are you going to send your samples in to get DNA tested? And he looked at me, we were sitting together getting high. And he said, why? So we can prove all these genetics came from Rob and Dave. <laughs> and I was like, I get it. I get it. And, he, and, and I get it. I get it. If you've made a living making millions of dollars selling Jack Daniels whiskey in your distillery and you ain't never had to pay Jack, I don't think you want to, I don't think you want to, who is the daddy test? You know, because do you really want it to come back and say, you're not the father, Ben? Actually, it's him, you know, and 
you know, and I, and I think that's what a lot of them don't want to see happen. And unfortunately, when you even look at Phylos, which is interesting on a lot of levels, I don't agree with what they did with community and conception nurseries and all that aside. Um, but when you, when you look at what they were doing uh, and you look at them using OG Kush as like a backbone to all these other varieties, I think it's misplaced. If you took out OG Kush and you put Northern Lights number two, then it would make sense because... I remember life before OG Kush. It was it was Northern Lights, and because Phylos didn't have a good Northern Lights sample, they didn't have anything other than OG Kush forward to go on. And it's, for those, I mean, OG Kush is 1996, 1997. It's not that old. I mean, OG original Haze 69, Skunk One 76. A lot of you know Northern Lights. Northern Lights was named Northern Lights when he sent the seeds to Neville. Up to that point, he was just keeping track of the crosses being made by the people within the circle that ha- he was sharing the Afghani seeds from Murphy Stevens with. So he, Greg does not take credit for making uh, Northern Lights number five. He said that it was a, a Herbie, I think, that worked at the sunset shop, the, sun, the indoor sun shop that worked for Murphy Stevens made it. But because they were all sharing genetics, Greg had some of those hybrid seeds and um and initially when he sent it over as northern lights he he spelt it l-i-t-e-s like a light bulb like turn the light on because it was all being grown in the north under lights and uh and you know because uh, you know l-i-t-e is more like illumination l-i-g-h-t more like the weight of something so he was going with l-i-t-e-s and neville changed it neville changed it to l-i-g-h-t l-i-g-h-t-s and called it northern lights but um the little the little funnies in the story have always intrigued me, but these genetics were floating around quite a while before Neville took them and broadcast them. And realistically, I don't think Neville was so much a great DJ as he had a great platform. I mean, he was like the first dude at Ibiza with you know two turntables and a microphone, and everybody's like, "Whoa!" <laughs> and and that and you know a lot of people have come since and probably been better DJs, but he was the first one to 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 seed bank it, turn it on, print catalogs and send seeds all over the world. So he deserves credit for being one courageous person. And unfortunately, he paid dearly for his courage. Yeah, a brilliant answer there. And I might just take us back a little bit because you just brought it up. We'll talk a little bit more about the Northern Lights stuff. And I guess one of the questions I was wondering was, as you mentioned, there were sort of different tropical males being crossed to this purist indica, and that's generating the different numbers, one, two, three, four, five. Up. Hold up. It's not just a female because they had the seeds of the purist indica. So as they would grow out the purist indica seeds, I have boys and girls of purist indica downstairs, so I can go either way. So it wasn't just uh, girls being married to tropical males. It was, uh, you know, and uh, when I interviewed Greg, he he's really humble too, man. He's like Sam. When I asked him, you know, what the genetics were, he's like, "Well, we'll never really know, will we?" <laughs> and, it's, and it's just a be- it's a beautiful honesty that I really appreciate because one of the things I don't like about the cannabis community is how certain people are about you know things they don't know. And even now, everything I'm saying is just from my journalistic research. Some of it's from my personal interactions, but you know, most of it's from research and me trying to gather stories from different parties and and finding the thread of truth through it all that's always been my goal i'm really not biased to what the truth is i just would like to know what it really is yeah beautiful sentiment there i guess it did make me wonder did greg ever mention anything about any of the other parents being kept in a pure form or was it just the purest indica and then they would just cross it but never keep the other things pure as well well, if you know, the way I look at it is this if you had groups of people like, you know, you have one guy playing with what was a Hawaiian, maybe northern Mexican, and crossing it with it, and he had his genetics, and then there was the guy that they referred to as the Indian who lived out on an island. He had his genetics and he crossed it together. So what I see is like uh a a a, a, pure, a pure color, a, a primary color, and then the color is shared. And then some people are mixing a little yellow, some people are mixing a little blue, some are mixing a little brown, some have yellow and and some have orange and they're all coming out with something slightly different and then they're sharing again. And uh, that's how Greg kind of described it. And um, 
it, it makes sense to me as somebody that has friends and loosely shares genetics and then gets them, go, you got to have these seeds back. I made them from your variety. It's, it's kind of like that. And, you know, Greg initially sent seeds to Neville because he wanted to trade with Neville. He wanted some of the varieties Neville had. Um, he made a comment though. He goes, Neville never sent me back anything nearly as good as we sent him. And so, you know, and, uh, and, and, I get it. I get where he's coming from too, you know, because if he's experiencing the F1s from his friends who are first making them, he's going to get more robust prodigy because they're going to have the, the <clears throat> hybridized effect of, you know, consistency, uniformity, and vigor more so than the plants that are being maybe inbred and inbred again, or being bred with genetics more closely related to one another. Uh, you know, which I'm sure Chimera talked about when he was on because he's, he's brilliant when it comes to breeding. Um, but, you know, normally like humans, we're not trying to, you know, have sex with our cousins because, you know, babies don't come out so good. And, uh, and it's kind of similar with cannabis. And, I, you know, I, I think this is also why a lot of Neville's initial offerings were so good because he was making these F1 hybrids with um, distinctly different genetics, original haze males and Northern Lights females or skunk, which didn't have any Northern Lights in it. Skunk Man Sam never had Northern Lights genetics. He never, he never got them. He never worked with them. Um, and on the other side of it, Greg never could get his hands on original skunk and never got his hands on original haze until you know, some fucking kid like me comes along and sends him to him in his retirement sometime in like 20, 2018, I think I sent him those seeds, you know? So, you know, it's, it, you never know how it's going to work out, but, you know, Greg was in Vietnam from 1965 to 1969, joined when he was 17 because he was going to be drafted and um, started smoking cannabis when he was in Vietnam. And, uh, brought back the habit or the hobby and started growing in 1969 as soon as he got home. And he was taking horticultural classes at the university uh, in Seattle and the University of Washington. And it's funny because he's in his 70s now and he is still taking university courses online and he shares with me links constantly about you know testing sugar content in your plants and like how to avoid different diseases and like light penetration and he's such an avid learner and I absolutely adore it I absolutely hope I have his uh vigor for life uh when I'm his age I guess it's not that long I'm fucking 50 now so I'm trying to just keep up with the health food but it's it's really cool and uh and he just kept it up. I mean, I think he met Murphy Stevens in around sometime in the 70s, mid 70s after the book came out. And he said to me that he first got those four seeds from Murphy Stevens in 1979. And it was one of the, you know, the best Afghans that he had ever gotten up to that point. Um, because a lot of the hippies uh, initially were breeding with uh, more tropical varieties that were coming in Thai, Vietnam, Mexican, Colombian. These are all semi-tropical. It wasn't until the hippies started coming back from the hippie trail with Afghan varieties in the mid seventies that these uh, skunky, stinky, uh, earthy uh, tones were kind of brought in and these fast flowering, heavy yielding, uh, broad leaflet uh, varieties were, were starting to get brought into it uh original skunk one started as one of these afghans crossed with colombian gold and that was skunk and then he took that plant and crossed it with everything he had until he realized that when he crossed it with acapulco gold that that combination of genetics when you grew out the prodigy and you bred the prodigy together would be consistent and uniform so he did that with all of the different ones he had and threw them away once he realized up oh, this is the right genetic lock in order to go with what I'm doing. Uh, really unique. I mean, a lot of people won't spend the time, won't, you know, he always, if you ever could talk to him, you'll say, you know, he kills plants more than he grows them. <laughs> but I get it, you know what I mean? Because you can't get attached, man. If it doesn't meet the standards, poof, out of the garden it goes. And that's what really makes great cannabis. And, uh, and I think that a lot of the, unfortunately, uh, you know, people that came along later weren't really working on the scale that he was working on, you know, tens of thousands of plants at a time, you know, uh, 50,000 skunk seeds or 50,000 original hay seeds in a single 50,000 square meter greenhouse going off at once and creating, you know, more seeds of its own 
variety is something a lot of us don't get the opportunity to do. So he was in a position to kind of maintain his genetic gene pool on a level that few others were. And when he, you know, from my interviews with him, my conversations, uh, when he was doing Hortifarm, there's no limit on seeds. Nobody cared about the seeds. You know, there's no drug content on the seeds. And of course you need to save the seeds because you need to grow more plants. So the one thing he could do was really intense breeding and saving of genetics. So he was in a really unique position uh, that unfortunately small scale seed companies, you know, any name, any of them just weren't in a position to do. Yeah, a position a few of us will probably ever be able to find ourselves in, sadly. I just wanted to bring you back for a moment to the Steve Murphy's Afghani, the purest indica. Did they ever have a cutting they kept or they just used the seeds every year? And as a follow-up, what type of Afghani do you think it is? Do you think it was just like a, a hash plant or like more akin to Afghani number one? Mm, Afghani number one, I got Afghani number one. You know, I sell Mel Frank's seeds. Mel Frank is 77 years old now. We've been friends for since 96. I met him at Positronics in Amsterdam one day when he was walking through and he was complimenting some plants and I was the one that was growing the plants. Um, and we got to talking and it was just a really good connection and we became friends. We were best friends to this day. And um, the Afghan number one is okay. Uh, it's not... Uh, the Northern Lights Purist Indica is really uh, exceptional. And the, the Afghani number one has, in my opinion, some more tropical influence in it. It's not pure Afghan like the Purist Indica is. And uh, it's it's okay. Um, it, it, and, you know, maybe I'm really sticky too, though, because like, you know, like, uh, <clears throat> you know, when you have one thing and you think it's great, it's because sometimes you don't have things to compare it to. And then when I had other things, I, I, when I had Afghan one initially, I thought it was great, you know, but then I got all these Northern Lights plants and these Afghans, the purest indica from Greg, and I thought, whoa, that's really incredible. So it changed my perspective of Afghan number one. Um, but, you know, I, it, I'm going to sound like a jerk too, but I don't really like Durban poison. Um, I sell the seeds because it's authentic Durban poison and it has... A, a real it's got a great bud structure it's super fast it's got great resin a lot of people smoke it love it so you know screw my opinion but it's it's not one of my favorite varieties uh it, but you know what i've been trying to do with the seed company is really make these available to people because i don't know the you know the cannabinoids that'll be fine or the terpene combinations that'll be found and i think there's still a lot to be found in these genetics and i think all of the genetics are medically uh, useful. It's just a matter of, of identifying them and uh, and finding them in medical utility. And I think that's starting to happen. And um, you know, there'll come a day, I believe, when when people will go in and they'll have their endocannabinoid system tested, and and they'll be able to just look like they look at your blood and they can tell you what vitamins and minerals you're deficient in, and they'll be able to you know pull off the shelf all of these various. Um, single cannabinoids put them together and maybe add some terpenes uh for uh you know a bit of an uh i hate to use the word entourage but it's 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 more of an ensemble effect and uh and and the way they synergistically work together will be how we use it to balance our endocannabinoid system and um the more we have these genetics available and the more people can start to grow them and test them and and discover them you know, the more we're going to have, uh, more colors we're going to have to pull from when we're turning around and trying to, you know, color in our life and make it, make it better. You know, cause I, you know, obviously I've had cancer a bunch of times. I'm pretty certain we're all going to die at the end of this wonderfully short trip, but it's about our quality of life. It's really about, you know, the time you're present and being present and treating, you know, time like it's a present and really appreciating it. And I think cannabis plays this really key fundamental role in our wellness. And I think this really becomes a conversation about wellness um, more than it's a conversation about, you know, getting high on a Friday night, you know, and feeling good. 
And I think more people are going to start to understand that as they come to understand they, that they have an endocannabinoid system and that it can help balance them better than pharmaceuticals or better than heroin or better than alcohol or better than smoking cigarettes. Um, a lot of people, I think, are going to turn to cannabis like you and I have um, and uh, really help their, help their life considerably. Yeah, here, here. Hopefully, hopefully the medical sort of improvements lead to exactly that. It would be fantastic. Something a little left of field, but I thought you might have a good perspective on was often when we talk to guests about the really old school genetics, they reference how they really liked them because there was no ceiling. You know, weed these days, it only gets you so high. And I guess I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on the ceiling effect and what it is. Like, how does it occur? Is it just do? We, is it just land races have no ceiling, and when we hybridize things, they get ceilings? What's your thoughts? I get what they're saying. I mean, I've been sitting here for an hour and thirty-two minutes with you, and I've only managed to smoke half a joint of this stuff, and it's a lot because with the haze, you feel it. You know, like you you hit it and you feel it, and you go put it down for a minute because you're like self titration happens quickly when you're smoking this and. I, I get it. I mostly I feel like with the haze varieties that this that, that you can keep getting higher and higher and higher. But I feel like you end up doing what I'm doing, which is you hit it a little bit and go, whoa, 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 I'm doing an interview. I gotta keep my shit. And you end up putting it down. Um, I find half joints of haze all over my house all the time. And I think that's because I get really high and I put them down and then I get distracted and I am so high, I forget I leave the joint there. And um I don't do that as much with. Uh, more of the modern varieties. Unfortunately, if I go to the store in California, buy some pot, I'm not that impressed. And uh, I've been fortunate enough to be a cannabis cup uh, judge for high times for the Emerald Cup, uh, for the Secret Cup. I've been a photographer for them. Uh, for Chalice, I've been a judge. Uh, so I've had some exposure um, to cannabis. Unfortunately, a lot of the cannabis floating around California is quite homogenous. And it's very similar there's not a lot of standouts. What they call haze isn't really haze. Um, I was judging concentrates and I sat down next to the gentleman that owns, um, I would, I'll just say a gentleman that owns one of the uh, bigger extraction companies. And um, he always gives me what a little jar, whatever he's smoking. And uh, I gave him mine and I had made some extract out of haze and he opened it and he smelled it. And he was like, what is this? And I was like, that's original haze. Um, and he was just like, holy shit. And we were sitting with maybe a hundred plus samples in front of us. And I made the comment and I said, you know, what's weird after smoking all this stuff, I feel like I could put this haze jar down and it would stand out out of all of these. And he goes, oh, I've, it's, it's absolutely unlike everything else here. And we had, I think, 119 samples in front of us that year. And it's just because growers didn't want to spend the extra time. I mean, you take Northern California to an example, you know, when you get north of San Francisco, it's not the most hospitable place to grow cannabis. Your ability of variety is limited uh, by your early winters, your early rain, your, your heavy humidity, that coastal fog. It's a challenge. I mean, I have hats off to everybody in Northern California that can turn out really high quality cannabis. And there are a lot of people who do, um, but they're not growing no three-way Colombian haze up there until December with that weather. And so they're limited. So because they're limited to their environment, we see the limit to their genetics that they offer as well. The Emerald Cup is my favorite event in the world and everybody should visit it. But when you go to the Emerald Cup, most of all those varieties have always been under 10 week varieties. Only last year when I was there taking photos for Grow Magazine and they had all of the varieties separated by their dominant terpene. It is the future, man. And, and so now you've got orange competing with orange and you've got gas competing with gas and you've got sweet tropical with sweet tropical and you've got, you know, hazy, you know, train wreck type varieties competing with hazy train wreck type varieties. And you're not trying to compare, you know, California orange to OG Kush, which are completely different. And um, by breaking it down into your dominant terpene category, you're starting to get a better understanding of which, like, let's go back to colors, which primary color group that that ha variety happens to fall into. Because if it's pinene or if it's terpinaline or <clears throat> myrcene dominant, uh, it's going to fall into that group. You know, a limonene dominant terpene plant is going to smell lemony 
period. So group them together, judge them for what they are. And uh, I think that's really neat. Unfortunately, there wasn't very much when it came to really hazy varieties offered at the time, because again, it's an organic Northern California event. And when they move down to maybe, you know, they're not really growing it in Santa Barbara yet either. But when you see growers starting to grow cannabis in areas that are more warm and they can leave plants in the ground until November, December, you know, uh, when you start getting south of Santa Cruz in California, you start to experience this type of, you know, summer all the time weather. And there's really two distinctly different weather patterns in Northern California that split around Pismo Beach uh, north of of Santa Barbara and Santa Barbara South, you've got hot, sunny days, you know, all year long. And then North of Santa Barbara, you start to get more wintry as you get more North and, you know, people are going to start growing, you know, these long flowering varieties in places like Northern Santa Barbara and Santa Barbara and LA and, and further South. And it's going to be fantastic. And I think you're, you're going to experience cannabis like we haven't experienced in decades because a lot of the cannabis coming in in the 50s and 60s was coming in from tropical semi-tropical places um that changed when we started getting stuff from afghan and then the 70s when the hippies um and others started mixing together hippies and the soldiers started breeding, breeding together various varieties of cannabis and coming out with the hybrids that we the haze the skunk the hindu kush the calio the afghani one uh, the Durban, you know, we could go on and on about what became of those land race varieties that those guys originally got in the first place and then morphed them into the varieties that we know today. And then those primary varieties were crossed together to make a lot of the wedding cakes and the the, the Skittles and the runts and the stuff that we are now referencing to today because none of that stuff was bred from brand new land race crosses. It was all bred from, you know, the seeds they got on, you know, vacation to, you know, Amsterdam or through a friend who was already growing and, you know, quality was just passed on, passed on. Cause you know, why go through all that shit and try to, you know, recreate the work others have done successfully when you can take skunk one seeds, grow them out and then take another variety, grow them out and mix them together. And everybody claps at you because, you know, you're a DJ and they didn't think of mixing together the Beatles white album and the Jay-Z black album until they heard your gray album. And then they're like, Oh, that's the shit, you know? And, you know, again, not musicians, but still, you know, I think the best thing these seed breeders today can do is give credit where credit's due. The reason you don't see me making up a lot of funny names on my seed website is because I'm just trying to give credit where credit's due. I'm not trying to come in and pretend like, you know, you know, I'm not, you know, reinventing the wheel i mean i do make varieties that are unique to me that are unique to my company um, but usually those in those cases i just call them what i made it out of because i want to leave breadcrumbs for the people who buy my seeds so that they'll kind of know where to go with their crosses because then it gives them it's like a dog or pedigree information and if they have the pedigree information it, it, you know maybe they can make a better cross after they get my seeds and they cross them with something they have and I encourage it. I think it's great. Where I think it's kind of shady is when, you know, I sent I sent a company seeds in February, seven months later, they knocked off those seeds, claiming that now they finally have skunk. And then they they told a brand new story about skunk one, said Sam the skunk man got out of jail in 1981, and that these seeds came to France in like 1974 kilo. And it's all bullshit, man. Like Sam didn't even make skunk one in 1974. It didn't come around till after that. And these people that come and they try to reinvent the history to benefit themselves. I think that shit. And I think that's shady. And I think they should get called out for it because I think that, you know, the cannabis community deserves an authentic and, and, and real history and not a history that's been maligned by marketing uh, people. You know, that were trying to market their seeds or market their company and trying to, you know, you know, basically steal the wind out of the sails of others because they're still doing it to this day. This is invariably uh, one of the discussion points I felt we were going to have to touch on, which hopefully give people a bit more background. But yeah, as you just alluded to, you know, there there has been some sort of ongoing What's the word they use in the news? There's been robust conversations between, 
<laughs> yourself and aficionado around uh, a skunk release. I was just wondering if you could give us a little bit more of the backstory on that. And I mean, simply put, they contacted me uh, actually way back in July of 2020 asking me for seeds because uh, they were following what I was doing. And I told them they weren't going to be available yet. Uh, I told them they'd be available in probably like seven, eight months. February of 2021, they contacted me saying, hey, can you know, we saw them on your website. Can we get some? And um, unfortunately, or fortunately, you know, it's weird. I almost didn't sell them the seeds because I, I, they have a bad, they have a reputation, we'll just say, of doing this with other varieties and other people. And I, I've had words with Leo, uh, who's aficionado here in California in the past. And, um, I, you know, it is what it is. But they contacted me through Frenchie Cannoli and I, just, I adore Frenchie. He's since we met, we were friends. I've, I got nothing but love for him. I think he was one of the most authentic people who had such a true passion and for cannabis. And I will miss him forever. And I am crushed that he's gone. And I, you know, I absolutely got nothing but love for Frenchie for sure. But they were looking for the skunk genetics and they were very upfront about that. And they contacted me and I, you know, this is why after he, he said I was a liar, I posted the conversation up on Instagram because I'm not a liar and I would never misinterpret the truth. And uh, I'm just not, it's not my thing. And uh, I'm not afraid of the ramifications of truth. So I don't have to lie. So anyone who has to lie can go for themselves in my opinion. So that's just how I feel. And uh, so I got him the genetics. I sent him some seeds. I sent him roadkill. I sent him skunk one. I even sent him extra seeds. I sent some for Frenchie. So he'd have some to grow at his house. Um, and, uh, yeah. And, uh, then they get the seeds like February 26th and then, you know, end of August, end of August, they released that bam, they got skunk one seeds. Now, uh, they F2'd their 1974 seeds from a kilo and told this elaborate story that was that such bullshit and people in the community, I think also recognized it as bullshit and started calling it out. Cause I mean, skunk one of all the freaking varieties to lie about why pick skunk one it's so documented um but he did and uh and it was weird so i called him out on it i mean i woke up that morning and called him out on it. it it actually happened a little earlier though because when i got the rks it was from that guy jaime in alaska who's another great guy he's an old biker that's been growing forever in a day and um people gave him nothing but shit for saying that he had roadkill skunk and uh he sent it to me and <clears throat> you know it is it, it it is it is really what he says it is it's just it's not as strong as people would 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 uh want it to be and i said this to him and i've been really upfront and honest about this to a lot of people i said it's there but you're gonna have to look through plants to really find that one that is gonna blow you away and stink out the car and you know be smelled down the street but you know since this conversation has started you know i don't know how much you're into the thiols so thiols are what i now believe are the cause of the skunk acrid smell in these plants humans can detect thiols in parts per trillion and it makes it hard for machines to even be able to detect it in measurable amounts as well so thiols are what i believe a lot of these afghan varieties that smelled like urine and acrid dead flesh and 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 skunks to americans um that's where a lot of this came from because when you talk to robert clark who is to me the foremost historian on cannabis in the world um a lot of the more tropical varieties have sweeter scents and um a lot of these more you know lemony and, and citrusy and flowery tones we're getting are coming from the acapulco gold the colombians the the thais the mexicans and such um so these thiols are what i believe initially when everybody started breeding with the afghans they all took on this heavy scent but because the way humans work is that this is something that when we smell makes my our brain think oh this is going bad avoid it we slowly bred away from it and bred towards the scents that were more appealing, which were the fruity, flavorful, tasty dessert type. You know, when you walk, go for a walk down the street, you do not stick your nose in a pile of dog shit. You stick your nose in a rose. You, you, you smell flowers. And, and I think for cannabis cultivators, especially considering that that stench of shit would get them busted, they just all 
maybe subconsciously bred away from the thiols and moved towards the more aromatic plants. And um, I think that's what happened to cannabis. And I'm not even telling people this, but the purest indica, because I don't want to see their heads explode again, really smells like fucking skunk. I grew up, I'm in California. They get dead skunks on my street. My dogs come home skunks sometimes. I've lived with skunks since I was a little kid. We have them in New England. Um, funny enough though, they're only North American animals. There are no skunks in Europe, none of them. And none of my, this is what weirded me out when guys like Ben were like, oh, I called it skunk. I was like, Ben, you've never visited America. How have you, I asked, have you ever seen a skunk outside of Pepe Le Pew? Like you mean in person? Yeah, do you even have them at your zoos? Mm, no, I don't think we do. Mm -mm. Okay, so how would you know what a skunk smells like? And if you smelled a plant that smelled nasty, like in the UK, they refer to it as cheese. Because if you go to the UK and you smell that nasty ass shit that they come and eat, and that, that nasty, ass, they, they call it cheese. They wouldn't call it a skunk because they don't have skunks in England. So they wouldn't call it something they don't have in the Netherlands either. So it makes sense to an American when you smell it, it smells like shit, it smells like dead skunk, it smells like acrid, rancid, nasty, which also contains thiols in the skunk spray. So the relationship to me makes sense. And these, you know, the skunk one seeds that I currently have, I have only been reproduced twice since the 1980s. Skunk man, Sam gave them to Mel Frank in 1988. He put them in the refrigerator until 1996 and then reproduced them in 96, put those reproductions in the refrigerator and left them there until he took them out in 2019 and gave them to me. I started growing them out and realized, fuck, these things all still smell acrid is they don't smell sweet so i did a selection of the most acrid plants filled my greenhouse reproduced the seeds um they came out great people have been loving them um the people who don't grow them hate on me and say i don't really have skunk and the people who do grow them love them and say that they that skunk doesn't even much skunk smells sweeter than these plants one guy said you know so and i get it though because these genetics are literally old they're literally from the 80s they're literally from way back when and then i got the ones from greg they're from what he says from the earlier 80s they still have these like thiols that are present they still smell skunky to me and i think that as we do more selections that we are going to be able to bring the funk back in much of these afghans if if we're looking for it if we're breeding towards <clears throat> flavor and taste and, you know, trying to make dessert recipe type flavors, we're obviously going to move away from thiols. But if, but if, if people consciously do what I did, which was throw out all the sweet plants and breed together all the stinky plants, I think over time, just like we can manipulate uh, terpene levels and cannabinoid levels, we could manipulate thiol levels and raise them in future generations of plants and kind of bring it back, bring it back, bring it back a little bit at a time. So, um, yeah, it's been an interesting, uh, it's been an interesting journey. Cause when I first released haze, I had a lot of people saying, you don't really have haze. And I was like, fuck you. And then I really skunk one and, oh, you really don't have skunk. Nobody has skunk, uh, you know? And it was like, whatever. And fortunately now with Northern lights, nobody's giving me a hard time, you know, but Greg is a little more uh, active on social media and it's a little different, but, um, yeah, I had a lot of naysayers at first. And even Skunk Man Sam's been on shows like Hashford saying, yeah, Todd has my seeds. That's, they're real. And, you know, and I don't know why it's so hard for a lot of people to want to, that don't want to believe that, you know, I mean, it's a little ridiculous. I actually saw like a disparaging comment by, uh, what's the guy that got the, uh, he got the Tom Hill Hayes or whatever. He got the Positronic seeds in 1996 and he, brought him home he made some seeds and he named the haze after himself and i was living practically at posi i had fucking keys in my own office of, at posi and i grew out those seeds and unfortunately they weren't that great at the time and and he bought them and thinks they're awesome and i think that's great but then i saw him on one of the forums basically talking shit about he doesn't know what i have but they can't be as good as what he had and i'm thinking really I skipped over 10 years of Bernard's breeding and went right back to Skunk Man Sam and got the original hay seeds from him. And you think the ones that I got from Sam are not as good 
as the ones you picked up from Positronics on a trip to high times, I just blows my mind. And I doubt, honestly, that Tom picked up thousands of original hay seeds at Positronics at the time, because one, we didn't sell them in very big packages. And two, most of the people there were not buying thousands of seeds when they got there. And I have had thousands of original hay seeds to do my selections through. And I would tend to believe it's like a lottery ticket. The more lottery tickets you have, the more of a chance you have to win. You know, if you went home with even a hundred seeds, I, I can't imagine how you would get selections as good as somebody who went through thousands of seeds looking for selections. So it's, it's, it's what it is. I, I think a lot of people want to, I don't know, they get on a high horse and they really feel like they deserve credit for things that really they don't, you know, just because you went and bought some seeds at Positronics, man, doesn't mean you're doing anything. Just because you bought some seeds at Positronics and mixed them together and then sold those seeds doesn't mean you're doing anything. And like me, I am trying to not influence the Hayes genetics in a sense. Like, like I am out crossing and making my own varieties, but that's not original Hayes. And, and I'm trying to not fuck it up by listening to skunk man sam and doing the breeding the way that he recommends i do it because i want other generations to get the opportunity to go through these seeds as pure as possible and to be able to find their own selections and 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 hopefully you know become great djs you know that's kind of what i'm i'm kind of feeling like i'm the bridge between the older generation and then the younger generation of newer breeders and i kind of feel like i'm the anti-cannabis cannabis company because I'm really trying to get the genetics into the hands of, of, of the community before these big corporates show up and try to turn it into IP. And once they get their hands on a, you know, purple passion or a fucking OG Kush, they're never going to release it. They're not going to cut clones and sell them at the shop. So you can grow the shit that they're selling never in a million years. So I think this genetic preservation is super important. And, you know, I, I wish more people like Tom would see that we're all, uh, you know, trying to benefit the community and, and it's not a fucking quarter mile race. It's not about, you know, who's got the best of what it's like, these are plants we're talking about. And, you know, they're all unique. Every single plant in a sense is a unique fingerprint on the planet and you don't know its benefits or it's, you know, until you grow it out and experience it. And I wish more people would be open-minded to that. And I wish more people would you know, kind of have that open-minded approach to breeding and looking for the best quality and, and, and looking for the, you know, best medicine rather than, you know, looking for an ego stroke. Yeah. Look, I can understand how understandably frustrating it must have been to have to deal with all the questions about validity of stock and whatnot. I mean, it's, it's interesting and coincidental you bring up Tom Hill because I, was, I actually had a question I was going to ask you about him, so we may as well do it right now. On the photos I've seen you post of uh, the purest indica, it looks obviously like Northern Lights, but it also kind of reminded me a bit of Deep Chunk with the way like that resin's so thick, like you can tell like this has got some serious Afghan hash plant type vibes to it. Have you ever grown out any of Tom's lines, like specifically the deep chunk? I mean, it's not really his lines. They're just land races. But um, what's your thoughts? I don't think they are land races. I mean, just because you bought some seeds from Positronics doesn't mean you're working with land races. And, uh, you know, the, the thing is, is these Afghan genetics are dominant in a lot of this stuff. I mean, Neville did a lot with Northern Lights number two. Northern Lights number two is one of my favorites right now. It's so OG Kush, it's crazy. Uh, I asked Greg years ago if he ever smoked OG Kush, and he said to me, he said, yeah, 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 it's just NL2. He made a joke. He said, Todd, we used to grow the NL5 and sell it, and we used to grow the NL2 and smoke it. And I thought, oh, that's hilarious, man. And, uh, you know, and it's because the NL2 was funky and heavy and fucking, you know, dank as fuck. But then the NL5 was more of that tropical kind of like, kind of light high, you know, better yielding and shit like that. So quicker growing because it had a little more of the more tropical equatorial genetics in it. And uh, I got what he meant, you know, and, and, uh, you know, a lot of this stuff, you know, Neville was a blessing, man. Neville spread the seeds around and Neville got these genetics into the hands of many people that then was, had an opportunity to breed with them. You know, what Neville did it is was was a beautiful thing for the world and uh and he should always be revered revered for that because it put the genetics into the hands of many people um 
and I, I think it made a big difference in the, in the overall quality of cannabis, you know, in all reality, by going through these selections and getting, you know, these like Afghans and different things, you know, out so that you could mix it with your hazes and stuff. It was just an absolute, you know, blessing to the world in the way, you know, not having to go through, you know, land race tie or land race Afghan or land race anything, you know, to, to start at the bottom and try to work your way back up. Sharing the genetics was like, starting on you know the top floor after all these people had done selections and breeding and and made seeds and like every single time hopefully was an improvement and and that's why i think in a weird way that there was the first wave of breeding was all about quality the second wave of breeding was all about quantity meaning either quantity of seeds or uh the fastness and like the 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 the, the the amount of cannabis you'd get in a short amount of time because you know people wanted that they wanted quick they wanted heavy you know they really didn't they didn't ask you for the highest quality you know when you were selling seeds in holland i mean everybody was like what's the fastest heaviest yielder you got i was like okay you want big bud but who the f- wants to smoke big bud i mean i used to work for simon at serious seeds in the day uh, cleaning the seeds and stuff and um you know chronic was cool to grow but if there was chronic AK and Cali sitting in front of me, I smoked the Cali, then I smoked the AK, and I'd probably give away a little of the chronic, but, you know, like, I, that would be the last of the pot to smoke, you know, because <clears throat> it was the least effective, in my opinion, but it was the heaviest yielder we, we offered. I mean, Big Bud, um, Big, Big Bud wasn't the biggest winner of any of the cannabis cups I ever remember. You know, but a lot of people went over there trying to get big bud seeds because they wanted heavy, fast, you know, the, the prohibition market demanded it. You know, if you could turn over six crops a year in your house uh, growing, you know, an eight week or, or you could turn, you know, four crops or even worse, you know, two crops a year growing something that was four to six months, what were you going to do? You know what I mean? At the pure economics drove the conversation to where it was. So. You know, I, the funny thing is I got, I always hoped to meet Tom Hill. Actually, when I, when I was younger, I, you know, I, I had reverence for all these breeders that I heard of, you know, I went to the canvas cups. I used to enjoy meeting everybody. It wasn't a big, you know, <sighs> who's got the highest THC game. It was just about making friends. Uh, so I was a little bummed when I saw him talking crap, but, you know, I, I'm sure he has good genetics. I'm sure he's done good selections. I'm sure he's put out some good stuff. You know, if I had the opportunity to smoke weed that he grew, I'd be happy about it. I would love to try some of Tom Hill's haze and stuff, especially because I've been able to get original haze from Skunk Man Sam and grow it. And I've because I've had great cuttings of another light of Neville's haze and smoked and loved it because I worked at Posi and was growing fucking haze for the whole year of 1996 and, and trying to go through different varieties to figure out which ones I like best. Uh, I have a lot of experience with it and I would love to see you know, his secondary color and what he's made with it. I think it would be cool, you know, but I don't know. Personally, I would rather have the seeds that, you know, Sam keeps for himself and doesn't sell to anybody than the seeds you can buy at Positronics. So personal preference, of course. I think I'm there with you. Don't worry. And I mean, you, you touched on OG in that answer. And I guess I'd be interested to hear a little more about your thoughts on OG in general. Is it a strain you like? Like, would you ever grow it and smoke it? Or do you feel like it's just superseded by the NL? Uh, You'll laugh. But when I got out of prison in 2004, I didn't have any money. Kind of in debt and everything. And uh, my friends that grew OG Kush gave me back because I kind of had it before I went to prison too. Uh, They shared the clone with me prior to prison, but I can't. I wasn't really talking about that. And I won't say you gave it to me, but then when I got out of prison again, um, it was offered back to me again in 2004. And I, when I got out of prison, started uh, Select Strains, which was a little nursery and what is on the cover, but OG Kush. And uh, it was my number one cutting, Sensi Star, Super Silver Haze, Rondon and Purple, M39. Um, and uh, I sold the shit out of them. I think I was the very first person to sell OG Kush cuttings in L.A., starting at the end of uh, uh, 2004, November, December, probably December 2004 was my first sale of OG Kush cuttings. And um, maybe a little later, maybe January, but not much later after Christmas. Um, Around that time, the guy that offered it to me, uh, 
I inquired to my friend who gave it to me and I went to him and said, Hey, may I sell cuttings of this? Cause again, I just didn't want to be an asshole. And um, he came back to me, said, Todd, the person who wanted you to have it died. And I don't think it matters. You can do whatever you want with it. You know? And I was like, Whoa, bro. And I didn't realize that. And uh, then years and years later, um, Adam Dunn had a show that he was doing uh, and he was telling this, he was letting people tell this real bullshit story about the origin of OG Kush. And unfortunately he had this guy that was someone I knew and that snitched on me. He was one of the government informants in my case. His name was Dave. And uh, I've known Adam since 94 and we're friends. And uh, Adam is from the East coast. We both grew up a little bit in Rhode Island. We're both kind of smart asses. And um, while the guy was talking, Adam, uh, joked with them that, oh, you should have just went to the cops and told them that you only grew it at one house and not all these other houses. And the dumb son of a bitch said, I did. I went to the DEA and told them I was only growing it here in Laurel Canyon <clears throat> and not to charge me with all these other houses. And I always knew that he cooperated, but I couldn't believe that he told on himself on Adam Dunn's show. And uh, after that happened, I, I heard from all these people that were like, you got to listen to this. And I was just like, oh, sweet Jesus. And um, and then when that happened, Josh D, uh, who's now pretty famous for, for, for being the guy from L.A. that had it. At that time, he was still underground about it. Uh, he hadn't made an Instagram for it or anything. And he contacted me and he said, uh, you know, in a text message, like, how did you get OG Kush? And I wasn't going to answer so I called him on video and uh, he answered and I said, you tell me if you if you think you know me and you think you know how I got it, you tell me who I got it through. And uh, the first name he mentioned, he got it right. And I said, whoa, wait a minute. Was there really somebody named Mad Dog? And he goes, Todd, that was my roommate. And he held up this picture of his friend who passed away from pharmaceutical complications and uh, he didn't OD or anything. He had a medical condition. and." Um, I was just, a, it was a really touching moment. And he said, you know, Todd, he used to cut out articles about you from the newspaper because this was before the internet. And he used to like put them on magnets on our refrigerator. So when I would come home from work, I could read the article about you, uh, you know, because we were both, you know, thought what you were doing was cool. And that's how in the 90s, he found out I had friends and he got me a cutting through friends. Um, but he, but I didn't know who, I didn't know who it was. I, he didn't give me the nickname. And then after I got out of prison, uh, he, the same dude went through friends, different friends this time and, and offered it back to me. And I said, I would love it. And, um, and then when I went back to ask, I found out he passed away, but then Josh kind of put it all together for me. Um, and the, it, the, the conversation I had with Josh was really sincere. Like there was no questioning Josh's like the authenticity of what he was saying. I was in LA at the time, you know, I, I, I know it. I, I was there, you know, so I, I knew more than I should, you know, and uh, and that's why I went to prison because I wouldn't talk about it. <laughs> I wouldn't cooperate. So just lock me up, you know, and, and that's what they did. Um, but then when I got out of prison, all my friends were still there and I had nothing but love. So I got a lot of good things given back to me. Like I had, you know, all my friends were still there when I came home. So it was really warm to come home to it. And then I just uh, so I got OG Kush. I love it. I've always been a fan of OG Kush. It's been a go-to mine for medicine for a long time. I used it in the net 2019 breeding against my on haze. Um, it's done really well for me. Uh, people seem to really love it. And, you know, but now that I have normal life number two, and I just did a greenhouse run of normal life number two, I can absolutely see who the daddy, mommy, daddy of, of the OG Kush was. And when I spoke to the guy who, who supposedly originally made the seeds in Florida, that the cutting came from, he told me that, you know, in 89, we went to the Netherlands and we bought Hindu Kush and Northern Light seeds from Neville. So that's all it can be. Because when I talked to him, I said, man, I think it's Northern Lights. Because I remembered, so my first experience with Northern, with, with OG Kush was in 1997 when I came back from Amsterdam. And when I smoked it in January of 97, I was like, oh, this is Northern Lights because I had just come back from hanging out with Alan Dronkers and going to the castle in 96 and, and being there smoking Northern Lights varieties that they had, stuff that they breed with, stuff that, you know, the stuff that they grow. So so I got to smoke a lot of different shit with Alan. Alan's a real pothead. Alan loves to smoke, loves his hash. He's, he's, he's really into it, you know? So we used to get high 
I've, I've had the opportunity of sleeping over at the castle and, you know, getting high with Alan all night long and smoking the stuff that was in the basement. So I, I feel like I've, I'm very fortunate to have the experience that I've had with, you know, the cannabis that I've been around. So when I got here and smoked it, I just thought it was Northern Lights. And then when I asked Greg about it, he kind of reinforced that. Yeah, it's just Northern Lights. And um, now that I've grown it, I definitely think the parents were Northern Lights. So, you know, that's why I think that in Phylos, uh, if, if, if in the six different types or five different types that they list out, because they list out like hemp, uh, wild berry skunk and uh, something like that, uh, and uh, one of them's OG Kush. If that was Northern Lights, then it would make sense for me because there would be Northern Lights and Skunk One, and then all the other things that came from it. But to put OG Kush up there with Skunk One, when there's like 20 years, you got to go back to the 70s if you're really going to get under the varieties that we have now. And those don't go to OG Kush; they go back to this Steve Murphy purest indica. Um, and I don't know if you've, have you seen the book I'm talking about? Have you seen the picture? I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. So, and, and I think the genetics don't lie. When you look at the photo and you look at the, the 1975 photo, it's like freaking twins. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. It looks, it looks the same. I definitely agree with that. I guess my mind then asks the question, I'm not sure how familiar you are in terms of growing out the different chem dog varieties, but the same sort of question often lingers around chem dog. Do you think there's NL in that? Yeah, for sure, one hundred percent. I've often thought chem, like chem ninety one, they call it, and OG Kush are closely related, without question. I've also grown grown stuff that came from the hog farm, uh, the wavy gravy, Northern California, and uh, it was very uh, Northern Lights as well. To me, Northern Lights has been Northern Lights number two is the is the mystery between Afghan and uh, because it was an Afghan. When I asked him what Northern Lights number two was, he said it was mixed with um, the Afghans that they got from uh, Oregon and California. And when he said, and California, it made me think, okay, this makes more sense because if you have zero mixed with like a California or Oregon Afghan, and then you take, Z, you know, number one, cause that becomes number one. And then you mix that with a California uh, Afghan or Oregon Afghan, you get NL number two, you're still pretty close to that purest indica. And as they were bumping up, um, that's where, you know, in his, in Greg's opinion, it was simply growth characteristics. The leaves became narrower, the plants became taller, the finishing times grew longer. So he just numbered them from closest to Murphy Af Murphy's Afghan to the most tropical ones that he had. And when you think about it, it makes sense why none of the numbers over five really became popular to Neville because Neville, once he got those male hazes, everything was with the male hazes it's as if nothing he didn't he he didn't have any other haze plants to use he says he had a female but he says he killed it because it wasn't that good so i don't i don't believe he actually had it to be really honest with you um but it it, it doesn't matter at the end of the conversation he, he stated many times that he only had two males um and <clears throat> I, I just think that that's why, in a sense, you get just a limited amount of secondary colors from what he could do with that primary color. Because if that those haze males were his primaries, it, it would have a good signature on every other color he mixed it with. You know, you know, just to use an analogy that people that maybe don't breed can easily understand. Yeah, no, look, I, I agree with you. I think if he had a female, he would have definitely made F2s and hunted through them and we would have heard about it. But interesting nonetheless look we've been having so much fun we skipped over the question we normally jump back to it around like 15 minutes in but we ask everyone what was your first experience with cannabis um i was sick i was my mom was a hippie and i was going through chemotherapy and radiation and i have a big scar on the side of my body from uh i had a tumor between my left lung and my heart for the first time i had it in soft tissue only it was inside a bone marrow and it would break my bone. My, my spine is fused. I had three locations in my skull. I had two more in my right ear. I had two locations in my left hip. I was in a wheelchair for over six months when I was a little kid. And then after all that, I got it again in between my left lung and my heart. And my mom had read in good housekeeping that uh, cannabis was being used for cancer patients. 
And she inquired with my pediatrician and he felt like, man, you have nothing to lose, Anne. So uh, she, being a hippie, already had weed. And when we drove home that day, um, she had me slip down. I was only nine years old. She had me slip down into like the front seat of the car and she had the air conditioning on and she gave me a joint and she told me to like, uh, she told me to sip it like it was a straw. And uh, so I got down in the little thing and I was, I was sipping it like it was a straw and I started giggling and, and feeling pretty good. And mind you, I had just went through chemo. I had just not only went through chemo that I went through radiation therapy because I was getting chemical therapy and then they were sending me to radiation. So it really sucked. And um, when we got home that day, I, uh, I wanted spinach. I was a big Popeye fan and I wanted like uh, sauteed spinach and butter. And, um, my mom was high and thought, well, what I do to my kid, you know, and, uh, she called my pediatrician and he said, you know, feed him, you know, and, uh, tomorrow don't give him any and see if it's different. So the next day we drove home and it sucked and I got home and I was being sick. I was up in my room fucking crying and puking and having a fucking moment. And, uh, she came up with a joint and said, Hey, sip it like it's a straw. Let's try this again. And we sat on the floor in my bedroom and I had a Don McLean American Pie 45 and you'd have to flip the fucking song over halfway through. And me and my mom sat there and she had a joint and I had a joint and I was smoking it, getting high and I get so high and I was so into the song and she hated it because, you know, they sing now is a good day. Today's the day I'm going to die, you know, and it's my mom, you know, fucking nine year old with cancer, fucking rocking out to this, you know, we're all going to die song. But, um, you know, it's an American anthem and I loved it. So it was just really amusing. And uh, that was kind of my first real experience getting high with my mom. And I think it saved my life, man. It turned me into an avid student and, uh, and I am grateful to this day, you know, to her giving it to me. What a beautiful, touching sort of story. Thanks for sharing that with us. How did it progress from there? Did you start, you know, as usual, sort of smoking as a teenager? When did you develop the urge to first grow? Um, well, uh, <clears throat> in a twist of fate, I, uh, I, I started smoking pot and I stopped smoking pot after the cancer for a while. But then when I was 12, um, my 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 stepdad was a biker a big six foot five monster uh you know tattoos down to his wrist and harleys and everything and uh when i was eight i got a motorcycle and when i was 12 i got another motorcycle and um i had a helmet on and my spine is fused my first five vertebrae fused solid so i'm a 12 year old kid riding trails on a motorcycle that was too big for me i weighed like 70 pounds and they gave me a 100 cc suzuki ts 100 and uh i was just a terror and I'd, my head would be bouncing around and it started to hurt so I was in seeing my doctor and I said hey you got to give me something for my neck he said no he said your neck's fused and it's not going to get better and the only thing I could prescribe for you is opiates and they'll become physically or mentally addicted and it'll ruin your life and I'm not going to do it so you got to learn how to deal with it and I was like that sucks and I was 12 you know and um and I said shit what do I do he goes well you could try smoking your mom's pot and I was just like, ha ha. And he's like, no, I'm serious because it might help. And, um, and I was just like, it was 1982 and, uh, and probably October. And I was just like, so I went to my mom and was like, Hey, Peter, Peter Smith was my pediatrician. Uh, I said, he told me maybe I could smoke some pot and it would help my neck feel better. And she was like, really? And I was like, ask him. And she was, so she did, because she believed me though. And she gave me some on the spot, but we did have a conversation about it when we went back to the hospital. Cause if I had lied, it would have been the end of me. And uh, so when we got there and she said, did you tell him to smoke pot? And he's like, yeah, how'd it work out? Did you try it? Then it was just like, okay, you weren't full of shit. You know, because like how many doctors back then were brave enough, but he had been my pediatrician since I was like two or three years old. So he had like, had such a close relationship with me and my family and my mom and dad were bikers. So they weren't exactly going to go to the cops. Like, you know, they may have been outlaws, but you could trust them. I know that sounds funny to say, but like they were, there was like dignity <laughs> within that. So like, uh, so he was cool with it. And um, I started getting bags of weed from my mom. And one day we were, we were, and I, I was sworn to secrecy, unfortunately, but uh I stopped with all the big kids because all the kids who had motorcycles were like fucking 17, 18, uh, 16 at least. And I was 
just like the odd man out. And uh, I walked up to the man and they had a, a little bag of brown pot. And I never saw a brown pot before in my life. My mom never had brown weed. And I was like, why is it brown? And they were like, because it comes that way. And I said, huh, does it grow that way? <laughs> and they were like, what do you know? And I had gotten a 20 bag from my mom that day. And I had split it. I'd, I'd rolled a couple joints, split it in half, left half of it at home, took half of it with me in case I wanted more weed and took the two joints with me. And uh, so I went back and grabbed a little half a bag of weed, which is now like a $6 bag of pot and, uh, and, and a joint and I lit it and I passed it around to all the, the big kids and every one of them, bro, started coughing their ass off. And my one friend was like, as he's coughing, he was like, whoa, this is what it's supposed to feel like. It was just really hilarious. And um, the kid, John, next to me was just like, where'd you get this pot? And I was like, can't tell you. And he was like, will you sell it to me? And I was like, yeah. I was like, how much will you give me for it? And he was like, if I gave you $20, would you feel like I ripped you off? I said, no, I'll sell you that for $20. Because <laughs> you know? I got more than twice that in two joints for $20 because it was a 20 back because my mom was a dealer. So I just was like, oh my gosh. And uh, right when I did that, my big friend said, can I get one too? And I had the other half at home and I was like, Yes. And uh, <laughs> so he only lived three houses away from my grandma. So I fucking like it was that was it, man. From that day on, I became uh, my neighborhood pot dealer. And uh, I my poor mom, dude, I went back to her that night after hitting her up for a bag that day and said, can I get another bag of pot? And she goes, oh, honey, yeah, I can't just keep giving you bags of pot. You know, I was like, because now I had like 40 bucks. I bought gas, which my, my gas tank didn't even hold a gallon. And I swear gas was like 60 cents back then. And, um, and like, I brought my friend to Friendly's and I treated and I think I spent $4. And uh, we got burgers and fries and sodas. And it was like $4, you know, it was 1982. So, uh, so my mom looked at me and I was like, can I just buy it? And, and the look on her face was sheer fucking horror, you know, but she's like, I guess so. And, uh, and I was like, cool, can I pick? And then she was like, I put the $20 down and I went to go get the bag. And she was just like, she knew it was like, this is not good, you know, but uh, I started selling pot to my friends and uh, it worked out really well. And uh, by the time I was like 12 years old in six months, I was probably selling like $200 worth of weed to my local friends, you know, cause I'd buy an ounce and I'd split it into four bags and sell them for 40 each. So I get like 160 per ounce. At, for like a quarter ounce you know, for 40 bucks and um i never sold joints i would only give them away because when people asked me for joints i always felt bad that they couldn't afford a bag of weed so i just give them a joint give them a hug because i felt like there was karma in the world and i felt like if you were giving away joints and somewhere somebody was like lighting up a joint that they couldn't help but to think good thoughts of you because like you just hooked them up with the joint for free, you know, and like, I don't know, like, I felt like if a lot of people were thinking good thoughts of you, that your life would be a little bit better is what at the time my thought process was with that. But, um, and then I went to sell a bag of weed to my friend's older brother. He was all of like 19 at the time. And when we got to his house, he had a Mel Frank grow book and he had, um, he had built, he was a construction worker. So he built like this plywood closet in his living room where most, most normal people would have a television. And it was like four feet, maybe four and a half feet wide because uh, he had four foot lamps in it. And then he, it was like maybe 18 to 30 inches off the wall and it had doors. And when he opened it and I saw our plants there growing with the fluorescent light, it was like the color version of the, you know, <clears throat> that fucking um the emerald brick road well, the wizard of ours like where they show color for the first time but like my whole life changed that was i was fucking floored man and uh i traded him the 20 dollar bag of weed for that mel frank grow book and i went home i cleaned out my closet i already had seeds i found the pots the the clothing lines that i used to hang the lights i found the fluorescent light i found the timer all it was all my grandma's my grandmother had the light in the basement the timer in the front window she had the pots in the soil out in the shed where she used to keep her pots in her soil and her watering can and i fucking dude it worked it worked so good and i grew pot for like a year until my grandma caught me and when she caught me it was fucking cute as fuck because the she came up like i used to have my light cycle eight to eight so when i was at school it'd be dark and uh, so she comes up at like 7.59 and 55 seconds and the lights glowing in the closet and she goes to touch me and the timer clicked off 
and she freaking loses it saying someone's in your closet someone's in your closet and i'm like nobody's in my closet and she was like show me so she pushes me towards the closet and i slide it open and i reach down and as soon as i click the timer she heard the sound of it she goes hey that's my timer and then the lights flickered on and she goes those are my fluorescent lights and she looks down and I had like these cool clay plot pots of hers. And she's like, those are my pots. That's my watering can. And I was like, Graham, the only thing I had to go buy was the, was the potting, was the fertilizer. And I've been dying to tell you why all of your house plants are dying. It's because you're not fertilizing them. And she was just like, what? And the plants were like six feet high because I didn't know what I was doing. And I was just raising the light as they would grow. And they, she was like four foot 11. She's Italian. And she like looks at this and she's like, they were bigger than her and man and they were in bud and the leaves were huge and she was like do you bring these outside i said no she goes they grow under these fluorescent lights i was like yeah i was really surprised myself and she was like couldn't believe i did it you know like she just couldn't and she couldn't she's like because they were clearly had been there for a long time and um I left that day with the deal that she wouldn't hurt my plants while i was in school and then i came home and i was like yo what's up? You know? And uh, she said, I think they need more room. And I was like, Oh, so she let me put them downstairs. She had me lay down a pallet, put my pots on the pallet so they wouldn't be on the concrete. And then she let me use some of her old drapes that had white vinyl on the inside. And I hung it to the exposed wood and I hung a fan up top and I had my fluorescent lights there. And she started watering the plants when she would do the wash. And then they finished. And I had my first growers dispute ever because I, like one in the morning i'm all stoned i can cut the plants down and the next morning i go down there and my grandma's mad and she's in the kitchen and i'm like what's the matter she goes what did you do to those plants i said oh, i harvested them she goes you killed them i said well that's what you do you kill them you know she goes where are they now i said they're hanging upstairs in my bedroom she goes you just killed them and i said yeah and she goes well what do you do now i said i plant some more seeds she said and start all over and I said, yeah. And she was like, oh, God, Todd, I can't. You should have left a little bit. She goes, I've been taking care of him. And I was like, and I realized at that moment how attached she had come to him. And I felt so bad. And uh, it was really cute. And uh, after that, I, I did my first cutting in the kitchen with my grandma. Uh, we actually put it in a napkin with uh, powder, like Hormex. I still use it to this day, number eight. Uh, it had been around since she was younger. And um, I put in rooting powder, put it in a napkin and we had it like in a little, like in a little, she had saucers for her tea and she would put a little water in the saucer and left it right there. And the fucking roots grew right through the paper towel and 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 it was neat. And, and that's when I started doing cuttings way back, way back in 1984 with my grandma. And uh, it was really cool, honestly. And uh, I, I, other than going to prison, I've never stopped growing since. Wow. What a fantastic, like real organic sort of story. That's so cool. You and your grandma grew together. I love it. Yeah, it's really funny. She took my Pringles can because I used to have these, uh, they like chips that come in America called Pringles and they, they come in a can. They, they're very much like this thing. So your chips are all like perfectly formed and they don't get crushed. And uh, it was really funny because I had Pringles cans full of seeds because when I get pot with seeds, I would take the seeds out and just sell the weed to my friends because they didn't want seeds and it didn't look good in my bags. So I collected all these seeds and uh, she she snatched one of my Pringles cans and she had a garden outside of her window where she'd have roses grow up and then she'd prune all the roses. So they all came just to the height of her window. So when she would open her window, it'd be all roses. It was really cool. She was like really good at gardening. You know, but you have to realize she was born in 1911 and her big like technological advancement when she was a little girl was her house got electricity. So just to put it in perspective, and she grew, she grew her food in the backyard and they, they, they had to understand food preservation and, uh, you know, cultivation was a part of human existence to her. So she's the one who taught me how to grow a garden in our backyard. And, um, and she's really where all of this came from. And I, I, We'll give her credit forever for turning me on to this. It was really cool of her. And, uh, but, uh, but she took my Pringles can and uh, turned the ground and then sprinkled this, these cannabis seeds, like broadcast style all there. And I'm in the backyard selling my friend a bag of weed. He goes, dude, you're going to get caught. And I went, well, like, I thought he meant selling him the bag of weed. And I was like, what the are you talking about? And he goes, dude, all these plants. And I looked down and they were all like knee high because as they grew up, my grandmother would take her hedger 
and just snip them like, you know, with the hedger, snip, 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 snip. So she had a little, like, it was probably a hundred something little plants, but, or more, but it was like, it looked like a little green hedge, you know, cause she was just like she did her roses. And I was just, I went inside and I was like, grandma, what are you doing? And she's like, don't you touch those. Those are mine. And I was like, grandma, you're going to get us in trouble. I was like, you can't just be growing. You can't do this. She's like, why? And I was like, grandma, it's illegal. She goes, a plant? And I was like, this is going to be kind of hard to explain, I think, you know, because she just couldn't wrap her head around the idea that a plant was illegal. Like she was like, the drug's illegal, but the plant, like, what are you, crazy? And I was like, oh, and uh, it was funny. And she did cut them down, but she was pissy about it. And um, it wasn't until I showed my mom and my stepdad and and they all were like, Lena, you got to cut these plants down. And she was just like, oh. she, she was hot. She was just a cool old lady. But, you know, it was pretty funny. I got my first traffic ticket when I was 12 years old speeding. I was doing 70 on the sidewalk. I got arrested. They towed my motorcycle. And when they took me to the police station, they made me call my parents. And I lived with my grandma, so I called my grandma. And uh, she drove a 69 Pontiac Firebird with like a, a souped up 350. It was hugger orange. My, my, my stepdad gave it to her because he thought that his mother-in-law driving a fast muscle car would be cool. So he gave her a fast muscle car. So I'm sitting in the police station. I'm 12. And, and the cop hears the car pull up blip, 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 and he goes, who'd you call? I said, call my grandma. And he opens the door and there's this little old lady standing in front of this fucking sixties muscle car. And he says, is that your car? And she goes, you got a problem with that? And he was like, Oh, this is definitely your grandson. And he had to come in and he says, he was doing 70 on the sidewalk. She goes, I don't think his motorcycle can go that fast. He goes, I had it on radar. <laughs> She's like, I'd have to see the radar. <laughs> and he was like, lady. And I was just like, I was sitting there laughing. It was just like, that was my grandma, you know, she was just, she was just nails, you know. So it was adorable. I, I'm grateful for her to this day, you know. And it's funny because I started growing pot 1982, 19, well, it was 1983, technically, the end of 83, the beginning of 84. And um and 13 years later, I was living in a Bel Air mansion growing fucking 4,000 marijuana plants with fucking, you know, a staff of six. And I kind of think, you know, how weird it is to go from living on, you know, like welfare because I was a pre-existing medical condition and we were poor as dirt, you know, to like living in one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in the United States, you know, growing thousands of cannabis plants in your own home. It's, it, I would never have expected that my little closet garden could end up you know to the places that it's brought me yeah wow what a wild journey it's been so what'd you think guys i thought it was great huge shout out to todd for taking the time to swing by and drop all that knowledge on us i hope you're as excited for part two as i am as usual, we want to give another quick shout out to our fantastic sponsors, CT Now, best seeds in the game. You know them, you love them. Go check them out. Coppered Biological Systems, your number one choice for beneficial predators and keeping any pests or pathogens at bay. Check out the Apipar M, the Spidex Vital, both killer products. Likewise, Promix Connect, your number one mycorrhizal product from the good people at Promix. You know them, you love them, they've been around forever. Try their mycorrhizal product, I promise. It's amazing. Highest spore count there is, guaranteed viability. Your plants are going to just go insane. And last but not least, your buds at Charlie's Cannabis. Check them out. If you're in Oklahoma, there's no other choice. Simply the highest quality available. Exciting genetics, new phenos and new strains on the horizons always. Check them out. Our good buddies, veteran owned, in-house produced. Charlie's your bud. Thank you so much, Charlie's Cannabis. Finally, a huge shout out to the Patreon gang. You are the lifeblood of the show. You guys help to ensure the episodes continue to be made. If you want early access to content, you want to hear unheard interviews, get access to exclusive giveaways, prizes, Discord, so much more, go check out the Patreon, www.patreon.com forward slash the podcast. 
That's it, friends. Thanks for joining me again for this one, guys. Making it to the end. I'll see you for the next one. See you.